to everyone attending this session. Um, this event is Missing Scenes, um, Taylor's Architecture Graduate Show for the graduating cohort of March 2021. So it is our pleasure today to invite um, three speakers from different parts of the world. We have from Thailand, India, and in Indonesia. And I would like to express my uh, gratefulness to all the speakers for accepting our invitation, our students' invitation to actually speak. I'll just like to briefly um, introduce um, the speaker. So we have um, Chet Pong Tran Rudimol from Thailand. And we also have Real Rich Sharif from Indonesia, both of which um, will, uh, are actually Taylor's University School of Architecture, Building and Design adjunct associate professors. And I would also like to take this opportunity to say welcome to Taylor's. And our third speaker is from India, Anand Sonecha from CLAB. So uh, I hope all of you will enjoy the session. And once again, thank you uh, for coming to this event. So back to you, Amiria. Thank you, Dr. Veronica. So to kickstart our first talk today, we have Mr. Chatpong Chunrodemol, or you can call him Mr. Chat. Um, his title today would be Sea Bastards. Okay, you can start now, Mr. Chat. <laughs> Thank you, Amira, uh, and uh, the graduates of Taylor's University, obvious, and uh, all the students, both graduates and undergraduates. Thank you, Dr. Veronica. Uh, it is quite a pleasure to be speaking and an honor to be speaking to the students. And um, I am very humbled to be speaking with uh, my great uh, uh, co-speakers, Anand and Real Rich. Thank you. Um, so to get started, um, I would like to talk uh, in terms of uh, somebody is sharing the screen right now. So I uh, has to stop sharing. Okay, great. Um, so today, I'd like to not present a regular lecture, but I'd like to talk to you students personally. So this talk is um, will be customized in terms of uh, me sharing experiences and ideas with you in terms of when we graduate, how do we create value for ourselves and be happy as architects, not only uh, kind of as a professional, but how do we find our own agendas and our own thesis to make our work meaningful to us. So I'm going to start with uh, an image probably everybody probably has seen um, that becomes to me a problem where architecture right now, because it's been globalized and all over social media, um, changes every few seconds. You can go on design boom, there's a spectacular design, and then in another five, ten minutes, you go to Archetizer, there's another spectacular building to design another spectacular building and all these images in Pinterest. So this is how architecture now is being commodified and spectacular architecture with a capital A inundates us, right? And you always feel pressure that you have to compete and you have to kind of be as spectacular as everybody else. I'm suggesting that there's an alternative to the way you work that's meaningful to you and it doesn't have to please everybody, but it pleases people that's around you and yourself. Um, I encountered this dilemma as well uh, when I first graduated about 22 years ago, um, caught up in the rat race of trying to produce work that I thought would be meaningful and worthy of being on a cover of some magazine, right? And in the process, I created very many mediocre projects <laughs> that had nothing to do with Bangkok. So my question was, how do I make work that's authentic to Bangkok, that's meaningful to my context? So I found I, there was a changing point where I was doing a lot of commissions, houses, and uh, doing work that I felt was capital A architecture, but in the end was very mediocre. But when I came to my own house, I felt this is my money. <laughs> that I'm going to spend on my project, I'm going to have my own agenda to make a project that's meaningful to me. And this is where I took a really 90 degree turn in how I changed my, the way I work. Um, so in thinking about what a home is, I asked what is important to me in terms of life, not in terms of creating a home that's 
uh, that's going to be on the cover of a magazine or photograph beautifully. So I want to know about life and how architecture could be viewed through life. So this is a photo of a typical uh, residential street in Thailand. I think uh, the kids in Malaysia, Indonesia, India have probably seen streets like this where uh, there are high end houses that are probably beautiful on the other side of the wall, right? But on the street, you put up these three meter blank facades because you're protecting burglars, right? To, to protect your own beautifully de designed home. And what happens is you kill the street, you kill street life. Street life used to be abundant in shop houses or whatever vernacular urban structures, right? So I start to ask, I'm gonna use vernacular language. Bangkok property walls are shitty. <laughs> that was my observation. It wasn't architectural. I said, this is a terrible state of urban affairs, right? But I didn't wanna say that every wall is bad, right? Um, so I asked myself, are they all really shitty? <laughs> so it started me to basically start to analyze my context in order to make a commentary on the surrounding walls, perimeter walls. So this site is basically the house that I'm speaking to you from. It was designed about 15 years ago. So this is one of the first projects I haven't shown in a while. So the site is this red dot. And what I did was to kind of educate myself was that I went and photographed all of my neighbor's walls, right? So there were blank walls, right? There were porous walls, and green walls. So there's a variety of walls, but in this little soy or an alley, the cute thing about our little alley is that the, the, the fences are very small and low and it had a great residential feel. So I learned a lot. So what I did was I started to invent drawings from this research. So this is a drawing of the alley. My site is right here. And I drew this alley as though it were a living room. And the walls of this alley were the fences of my neighbors. So this is a way to kind of create an understanding of my context. On top of that, architecture can't survive without people. So I befriended all of my new property uh, friends, asked them to get photographed. I also asked for a full body shot so I can Photoshop them into my crazy drawing. You have to find a way to create happiness for yourself. For me, I do these drawings that make me excited about architecture and make me see the world differently. So I created this alley room. I kind of invented this drawing. And in doing so, I created my own context for which I design what I call the living boundary wall house, which is my house that I'm sitting in right now. It's a very simple house, but it basically gives much attention to not only the internal property, but also the effect of the house on the exterior street and how it redefines the boundary wall that exists, I think, in Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, um, all developing countries. So it's a very simple house, an L-shaped house where you park here, dining, uh, sitting, TV room, and then there's the core of the house is this outdoor yard where there's kind of a special perimeter wall. So inside it's a courtyard house, right? Um, Oh, I'm sorry, the image, oh no, the image is kind of uh, a little bit too big, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm just gonna run through it like this right now, can you see? Yeah? Really sorry, you guys, it was probably uh, popped up. So basically the courtyard, it's a courtyard house um, where the two-story house is on one side, but then the perimeter wall is wrapped on the outside. But from the courtyard, you hardly ever notice that this is actually a street wall, right? I'm just gonna change this real quickly. I think it'll be okay. On the outside, the perimeter wall has been redefined, right? Um, they're made of wooden shutters that are closed. When closed, it's just a very blank boundary wall. But the fact that it's fenestration uh, that is kind of louvered uh, doors and windows, it creates an, uh, uh, an elevation or a face for the wall that's, uh, that's smaller in scale. But what happens is at certain times, the wall can open, accept, accepting life and connecting life between inside and outside, thereby redefining what a boundary wall is. So I start to make these photo collages, photographing 
not architecture, but life that happens within this perimeter wall courtyard. When we first moved in about um, 12 years ago, my son was three years old. When he turned four years old, we started to get into the house. It isn't a beautiful, it, not everything is curated. The yard can become a place where you drink, hang laundry, right? To ventilate, as soon as you open the uh, doors, you ventilate the yard. And then soon barns start to uh, figure out that you can escape from the house through these walls and go get ice cream. This is when he was nine years old, I think. And uh, in Thailand, we have a water festival called Songkran, where everybody pours water in each other. And you can see here, the neighbors are sh is shooting his water gun into our house. <laughs> so it becomes a connective tissue, this boundary wall. In 2017, we had a flood. So our whole f yard flooded and uh, uh, the canals of Thailand came back to the front of our house. So the house, our house became completely flooded. Uh, but you know, that's life. Life in tropical uh, Thailand or Malaysia, Indonesia, India, disasters happen and you live with it. So that, that was the first time where I started to look outside of myself into the context and start to research banal, regular, mundane things like a perimeter wall. This is where I started uh, to seriously look at how research could actually help educate myself and make me look at things around me that I normally wouldn't look at because I was too focused on creating architecture with a capital A. One of the first subjects that intrigued me was a construction worker house. Um, I'm sure we kind of have a version of this all over uh, Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, where the construction workers live on the job site, right? On an Unreal Rich, thumbs up if that's true. <laughs> so it's a concept that Westerners probably don't know much about because they're very, very, probably very tidy in the way they manage things, but we kind of hack our way through life. So the construction worker house, most people, including architects, probably look at it as slum, garbage, trash, and eyesores. But to me, when they put when they pulled down the tarp that was covering this elevation, I felt a breath of fresh air. I felt like this elevation is so full of life, right? But then in order to educate myself and not just be seduced by the romantic image of slum architecture, I started to go in and analyze construction worker houses. I start to understand that each one is composed of a core and usually wrapped by a scaffolding. Not, it's not something unusual, but something we overlook. This scaffolding is kind of an outdoor veranda, kind of an intermediate space that gives you a break from the sun, a break from the rain, but also because these terribly hot and claustrophobic corrugated rooms are unlivable in the daytime, the construction workers after work come out and hang out on the scaffolding, right? Cooking, eating, washing laundry, getting drunk, socializing. This is another construction worker house on the other side of the house, uh, on the other side of the site, they're building a condominium as you can see on the left. But this one has kind of um, hybridized the formula. So the scaffolding not only is a veranda, but it has a protective helmet, right? A, a protective second roof that protects um, the a thin corrugated metal roof from falling debris. So it becomes a second roof. So they're now they're playing with this scheme, playing with the scaffolding, right? This one is a single, a, a double loaded corridor. So the scaffolding isn't wrapping the structure, but it's actually what I call sate <laughs> and insert it in the middle, right? So even, but here, even the scaffolding works because it's kind of wind tunnel. Uh, construction workers still wash and cook and, and talk and socialize, right? Soon when they have this formula, they start to create larger uh, abodes for larger construction worker camps where it's core scaffolding, core scaffolding, core. It becomes an informal housing system. With this system, they can start to play, right? Taking the corrugated sheets, a thin one, folding into a V, turning it into a rain gutter, but also the same material has this beautiful reflective quality that reflects light back onto the underside of the corrugated roof. This is what makes me happy. <laughs> this is what makes me enjoy architecture. Um, and this is what I, I term Bangkok bastards. They're basically 
local street vernacular that are live, meaning that they still have to have a function right now. They're not historic vernacular, historical buildings that have been frozen in time and not allowed life to happen, but they actually have to be functional and living right now. I will only do that. I only record live subjects. The second, so I did, I've, for 10, over 10 plus years, I've been recording Bangkok bastards. And today I'll be switching back and forth between research and design to see how they kind of interweave. Another Bangkok bastard that I'd, I've spent at least eight years researching is called the Bank, the Curtain Sex Motel. I am sure we have a version of this in all of our Asian neighbor countries. <laughs> so what happens here, this is our version of the Love Motel, right? Uh, it's an unspoken typology. So here, it's usually a hybridization of the American motel, motor hotel, that businessmen that you see in series like Mad Men would travel across the country, stay overnight in these uh, free say, free wayside hotels to go sell shower curtain rings or Tupperware. But uh, the Thai population has hacked this typology and turned it into an urban motor hotel. What usually happens is, the story goes, a stereotypical elderly gentleman, probably well off, would come and visit the love motel with uh, a friend, usually not his wife. <laughs> There's a tunnel uh, that usually leads into the inner sanctum. The gentleman or woman would be driving in a darkly tinted car with his friend and go through this tunnel. Sometimes the tunnel is quite scary and dark and deep. But what happens is they usually emerge into an open indoor courtyard where an attendant would usher uh, the car into one of these parking slots. Um, and once you go into your parking slot, there is a hotel uh, a guest suite room at the, at the end of your parking spot. So you would take your friend and you go in and play cards or whatever you want <laughs> in your room and the attendant will close the curtain and then you, you take however long you wanna take. And when you finish, right? And we, we do these uh, drawings too that are lifelike <laughs> to see the activities of playing cards, quote unquote. So whenever you finish playing cards, uh, you leave, you get into your car, they open the curtain and then there's actually a secret exit on the side alley because uh, the husband or the wife could be waiting at the main entry. So this is how you make your getaway. So that's a, a unspoken typology in Thailand, right? So the Sam Sand Street Hotel is a project where all these research, it's a kind of a perfect storm where I'm able to just explore these two issues. Um, this is another curtain sex motel by the same owner uh, uh, and who, who asked me to actually uh, renovate this. And I convinced him to not do a curtain sex motel, but do a different type of street motel. This is called the Mit Paisan curtain motel. Mit, pai, mit, mit means friendship. So it's called the friendship motel. And this motel has a tunnel as well in the front, iconic tunnel. So you go through the tunnel and you merge into an internal court, similarly to the first case study. This one's a little bit narrow. So we kind of demolish the rooms on the right-hand side. The problem with all curtain sex motels are there. The rooms are incredibly small because pretty much all you do is play cards for 20 minutes and maybe or two hours. <laughs> and so the owner said, I don't want to spend a lot of money, right? I also need to make money off of this. So what you need to do chat is you need to design a room that sleeps three people, not just two people, three people. That's how I'm going to create my extra income. So this is what I showed him. This is a very small tight room, three and a half meters by three and a half meters, right? So this is our solution. They said, we're gonna create these bed boxes that cantilever off the existing facade so we don't have to introduce any extra foundations. So these bed boxes become kind of a bay window for you can play on your iPhone, read, and actually look down into the street below, right? So, and then most importantly, it sleeps a third person for the extra income for the owner. If this were the original building, um, stripped of its uh, uh, kind of brisole facade, we would introduce these bed boxes at the minimal, uh, uh, the minimal um, uh, dimension. 
one meter by two and 2.4 meters for one person to sleep comfortably. So what happens is there's a gap that's left uh, between all these extrusions. And the gap is filled by the scaffolding, the scaffolding that I talked about earlier. Um, and this special scaffolding, uh, what happens is, is this scaffolding will actually flip the hotel, a hotel that used to be dark, mysterious, introverted, uh, scary, into uh, an, a, a, mo uh, a street motel that is actually extroverted and simulates street life. And the scaffolding is uh, divided into three components, kind of the porch, the alley, and the outdoor theater, each one having its own uh, role. Uh, the alley, a vertical alley on the facade, uh, serves a very mundane but very important purpose. Usually when uh, de uh, developers contact me to do an apartment or condominium, they always say, please put in a balcony because it makes the elevation looks great. But as we know, living in KL or Ahmedabad or Thailand, Bangkok, nobody ever goes out in balconies in a city hotel, right? What happens is it becomes a space to put your air conditioning units or you hang your laundry or it becomes a space for mechanical systems, sanitary pipes, electrical conduit. What happens every time when your air conditioning uh, breaks down? The repairman has to walk through your room to get to the balcony, right? So this alleyway, a vertical alley, allows service repairmen to climb and access and serve service every single MEP component without having to go through the room. But then it'll have a secret function. I'll show you in the end. So this is that the vertical alley that slices through the new facade. This is a new fire stair. This is a, a temporary stair that actually accesses you up to the, the alley on top. Uh, this was derived from another local bastard. You guys have this in, uh, from where you're from, I'm sure. It's a gas station. Usually a gas station has a very high canopy, right? Five meters high. You ever wonder how they change the light bulbs? It's with this stair. <laughs> so every gas station in Bangkok has its own funky hybrid stair. You, they, the contendents use to change the light bulbs. We hack or we bastardize this to create our own uh, triangular stair. So another important component of the scaffolding is the porch. So it's a basically a covered canopy that uh, creates uh, what was unusable space, six meters setback between the sidewalk and the building into space that actually will interconnect the guests of the hotel room to the city. We designed these mobile furniture uh, that allows us to kind of spread out and colonize the sidewalk and streets. That's kind of inspired by Thai street food. Right? The owner himself, before being an owner of um, the hotel, had his beginnings in selling Thai iced coffee from a street vendor cart. He built himself up. So therefore, he had a sentimentality and affinity, a love for street food. So this is the neighbor next door uh, kind of preparing his armada of Thai sausages to be served. So what happened is we redefined the business model the hotel guests can be sent down to have street food for their breakfast. It becomes a kind of a symbiotic relationship where the hotel can advertise itself as a street, an authentic street food hotel. And also helping with the cause. Four years ago, the Thai government decided to ban street food because it wanted to clean up the streets, creating street food courts, much similarly to Singapore and some parts in Malaysia. However, it doesn't work in Thailand. Uh, street food vendors need to live near where they sell. They are nomadic, they roam. They have to be able to get up, go to the place where they sell without having to hire a truck or a taxi to take them there. So the fact that there are push carts that roam the street is a very integral part of street vendor life in Thailand. How do we keep that alive? So what happens is, um, there are little pods or plug-in stations where the street food vendor can actually plug into the hotel property without being chased away by the police, right? We also talk about new bastard architectural elements that the Western world don't know about. Architecture for me isn't just walls, floors, and roofs. On the streetscapes in, in Bangkok, we have stools, tables, planters, even crisp blinking lights that create space informally. 
we all know what that space is, right? It's never spoken uh, truly in the Western world, but it's our own spatial uh, element. During the opening night of the hotel, uh, the food vendors can, are allowed to plug in and sell their food on the property. Remember what I told you about the vertical alley that services air condensers? On weekends and Friday nights, it turns into a vertical stage where the hotel allows street performances to activate street life on this formerly red light district. So here's a little clip from the opening night and a street concert. as well as guests from other hotels. Hey. Just a little taste. I think we're kind of short on time, so I'm gonna uh, move forward. So as you go into the hotel, this is a checkout counter. It's kind of inspired by the uh, burglar grills, uh, wrought irons grills that we all see in our neighborhoods, right? but we kind of customized the design. Uh, the hotel still retains the original tunnel, the tunnel that uh, used to be driven through, but now becomes a pedestrian tunnel. But it becomes a, a new sequence to introduce a new courtyard. Once inside the new, a newly envisioned courtyard, it's no longer an auto court, but actually an outdoor movie theater uh, with a new swimming pool that isn't for swimming as it is for lounging to watch movies. We invented a new type of balcony, I call the leg dangling balcony, that allows you to turn around and watch the movie, but also forces you to turn around to look each other in their eye, right? Better than staying in the hotel room in your air conditioned space and playing on your iPhone, isn't it better to come outside and see your neighbors and watch a movie together? If you go, if you have a chance to come to Thailand, the atmosphere and the acoustics really great because conversations are had where you yell across and say hello to your neighbors. Um, in addition, while you're watching your movie, there's a special pulley system that brings uh, popcorn or local snacks up to your own balcony uh, while you're watching a movie. So in essence, this scaffolding actually is of the same DNA as this scaffolding scaffolding. And for me, this is how research eventually leads to design directly or indirectly. Can I have a time check? How many minutes do I have left? Um, you have about four minutes, four to four minutes, five minutes. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I think I'm gonna have to skip. Um, I'll show you one other cool. Uh, this is recently was just added uh, as part of our research. It's seemingly like two long tail boats, right? So what happens is we call this the bridge boat uh, bastard. It's on a canal out, just outside of Bangkok. So what happens is the gentleman in the yellow is a boat bridge operator. He hacked two existing long tail boats and uh, created this ingenious pulley system that pulls the bo one boat to the other side and the boat becomes a pedestrian canal bridge. This is the, these are the bastards that make me love studying these vernacular architectures. I discover everything new, something new every day. So on, on top of that, once we record this, we do drawings to um, not only to communicate the exact dimensions and tectonics of the boats, but actually to really draw the context. The context is really a part of the architecture. Um, 
whether it's the canal or the, uh, uh, the two sides and the people, the trash in the ocean, right? Through this section, you can see how the rope itself is ingeniously handled where uh, the boat operator gives enough slack so that when the boat passes, the propellers don't get entangled in the, in the string. We go in and we actually look at the tectonics of how the, each joint, each pulley system is, is created. So these drawings reveal not only the overall contextual relationship of the bastard to the site, but the smaller tectonic elements of it. Collectively, we start to collect this information to create a manual, right, for Bangkok, for students and architects uh, to uh, actually to understand where they're coming from and how invention is created in a most unique way in Bangkok, where you don't have to go into design and Eichertizer or Pinterest anymore. All you need is to open your eyes as you step out your door. So I'm going to skip quickly to the last few slides because I know we're running out of time to show you that uh, Mr. hopefully- Mr. you you, yeah. you have, sorry, it's not five minutes, but you have 10. So oh. yeah, mm. you That's don't have to, minutes. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see if I can do this fast. <laughs> um, I'm gonna skip to this then. This is in a hotel we did called Hotel Labris. So this is outside of Bangkok. It's a very non-urban uh, context. Um, so this context is in a national preserve, uh, beautiful mountains, almost cool, almost European Swiss-like. A lot of Bangkokians drive one hour and go spend time here. And perhaps because of the cool mountainous air, there's a lot of external Western invasion of English Manor theme hotel, Italian hillside hotel, even our own Leaning Tower of Pisa has invaded this. But to me, the owner asked, can I do something that is European in nature? I was caught in a very big dilemma because I always thought I only do modernism, sorry lady. But it opened my mind to see that, you know, everybody has a right to appreciate whatever language they want. Um, modernism isn't the only language. You have to learn to accept um, different types of languages, especially with the world opening up. The owner also asked to have a labyrinth <laughs> inside, uh, reminiscent of uh, kind of gardens in, the, in, in Europe or um, cloister gardens. I said, okay, let's make this work. Let's look at the garden, the Western garden prototype in a spatial terms, right? So what we did was in doing this hotel, how do you make something that's kind of Western theme into something that's local? So along with our uh, graphic designer branding uh, friends called Be Our Friend, we research all these local animals that live in Khao Yai or Big Mountain Preserve and created them into characters, magical creatures that inhabit this resort. So this uh, on this long plot of land, this master plan is envisioned not as zones, but actually chapters, like in a fairy tale. Chapter one is the, uh, the drop-off, chapter two is a hotel, chapter three are the villas, chapter four, the great hall or restaurant, chapter five is a pool. I'm just gonna talk about chapter two, um, the kind of the core of this. So this is the actual aerial photograph where each chapter is a hybridization or a bastardization of the Western labyrinth or the maze. Chapter two, the hotel is, uh, is the heart of the project where um, the hotel itself is presented in many ways. To the owner, I said, it's basically a castle or a palace <laughs> um, that actually encircles a, an outdoor cloister garden in the middle. But in actuality, these rooms are two strips of five by 12 meters shop house module, the cheapest, most inexpensive way to build. So, but the way you access this kind of secret garden is through this tunnel, okay? So you enter through this void and then you enter into through the, the, the kind of the meat of the hotel. Uh, as you walk through this void, you encounter an outdoor open air lobby in the middle. And in the lobby, you go up to the checkout counter where there are, I think there are 64 different drawers the, the person behind the counter will give you this magical guest pass 
there's a welcoming letter welcoming you to Hotel Labrys, a magical key, as well as a magical horn keychain. What you do is you take this key out into the garden where you find 48 different doors, one of which, none of which are the same. Once you pick your door, it leads you, and there are 48 different doors. And these doors, even though it's kind of a Western theme hybrid uh, uh, story, the doors are salvaged from Thai, old Thai houses and shop houses, but we bastardize them, um, making them more tropical doors. So you see this labyrinth, 48 doors are in, around this wall and each, each door leads you to a different labyrinth path. As you go through, you may see the end of the journey or it may, it may force you to turn. You either enter a room at the bottom or you encounter a stair that leads you to the second or third floor. Basically, we try to bastardize, tropicalize the original myth, the original labyrinth, a labyrinth created by King Minos to trap the Minotaur, the monster with the bull head and the, uh, the body of a human. But the original labyrinth had one entry and one exit. How do we bastardize it to make it appropriate for a tri-tropical mountain resort? Instead of one entry, you have 48 exits, 48 entries, 48 entries that lead to 62 different rooms. On top of this being kind of a, an elongated path to the hotel room, you can see it as another way. Now we have 48 or 62 different rooms that have its own personal garden. Um, so in a way, we've tried to reinvent what a tropical resort is through the Western tool of the labyrinth. So as you can see, you can come out of your hotel room and have breakfast in your guard labyrinth and path. Remember what I told you about the scaffolding uh, in the uh, construction worker house? It's also here, but it's in a different form. It's a concrete frame. Uh, I call this a tropical stone architecture, right? So that interstitial space that filters sun and rain is still here, but it's in the form of a different type of void and different tectonic. Tropical stone bastard. So you see the lightness of these voids. All of us share the tropical climate. All of us need these interstitial spaces that become uh, multi-purpose spaces, right? This, uh, in this sense, it reframes the mountains. The strategy, these are collages that we made at the beginning where we envisioned 30 years before uh, Big Mountain was only full of vernacular Thai houses. Eventually, when the resorts, the Western resort invasion came, you have a hybrid of different languages, but this hybrid becomes a new bastard. The twin to the hotel is the resident uh, is the hall in the back, the great hall, right? Um, the great hall in the back actually frames this yang na tree, a beautiful uh, 100, over 100 years old tree. So this roof actually frames this uh, uh, particular tree and the mountains in back. But even the iconography of this roof and the spatial qualities is multi-layered. As you go inside, you possibly see the profile of a Thai house. From other perspectives, it could look like the bottom of big ships. So with this kind of initial collage, we kind of beg the question, how can a high tie house on stilts um, that accommodates four or five people in a family, how can we hybridize this very small residential type to accommodate 200 to 300 people in a restaurant, right? So basically, these are two bastards that are the intermixing and the crossbreeding of, of Western and Eastern, right? Well, I'm almost done. <laughs> so lastly, how do I make this jump into from Bangkok to Southeast Asia? How, we, how can we learn together and create some new bastards? So this is a, a, a I would do lectures uh, throughout Southeast Asia. I love lecturing in different countries throughout this area. And this is one of the lectures I did about three years ago in Surabaya, uh, in Indonesia. Um, what I usually do, do, do before my lectures is I 
take a picture out of my hotel room. This was on the 15th floor. And I present this slide to the kids the next day. I say that there are bastards all around you, even in Surabaya. And the night before I gave this lecture, I always embark on a walking tour with the local, uh, local architects. So here we went to um, uh, one of the Kampang Kejewen lore, uh, perhaps real rich <laughs> may have seen this uh, in Surabaya. So it's basically kind of a fishing village. So uh, I went in, explored these beautiful fish smoking houses with these beautiful chimneys. And within that night, I do the small sketch to present to the students to see how easy it is to record your own bastard, right? In the same uh, Gampang, uh, there's also these beautiful pigeon houses. I'm sure some of you have seen these before, I think, which are beautiful. So we did a small little sketch as well to see how the inner workings of a pigeon house is, right? So I called them Surabaya bastards. So we're at this point now where Chat Architects is starting to uh, uh, travel to different countries. In the past two years through the internet, we're creating these little workshops. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, it was in Indonesia, we created um, Indonesian Bastards Workshop. Hopefully we'll be able to do uh, workshops throughout Southeast Asia uh, in order to collect and, uh, and, and do an open source website where everybody can upload their own sea bastard or Southeast Asian bastard and create a new collective typological uh, manual that will allow us to look at authentic local interventions. And we no longer have to rely on Dazeen, Architizer and Pinterest. Thank you. Thank you so much for the insight, Mr. Chat. Um, Okay, moving on. I think we have, the audience has some questions, so we can take a look at it. Okay. Would you like to read me some of the questions that you yeah. would like me to answer? Yeah, it will be on the screen here. Okay. So everyone, you can ask the questions through the link provided. Um, I'll begin with the first one. Uh, what do you think is a significant embodiment of culture and what makes Bangkok different than the others? Um, I would like to say that there are a lot of similarities in Bangkok to KL, right? Mm -hmm. When I show these slides, I know you guys recognize the DNA, construction worker houses. So I don't think it's, it's really about uniting us. I don't want, of course, all of us have our own variations of the construction worker house, our own variation of the curtain sex motel, our own variation of a hacked uh, canal boat bridge, perhaps. So if anything, it should empower us to say that Southeast Asia is actually more similar than we think. We are more united than we are divided. Um, and if we kind of band together, we can create collectively this really rich manual um, of, of typologies um, that actually could be the foundation of a Southeast Asian architecture. But within that, there are variations, right? It's not a strict rule, but there are guidelines of strategies on how to create architecture that fulfills life. So I'd rather focus on the similarities. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that answer. Moving on to the next question. Where do you draw your inspiration from to be more contextually aware in architecture? Very simple answer. I walk out my door and I open my eyes and see things with new eyes. It's nothing more complicated than that. There's no high end theory behind it. That's, that's, that's just it. And if uh, for me to prove my point, every one of you, after this lecture, you go outside of your room, if you're not in lockdown, <laughs> you walk down your street, and I bet you, if you look at your context with new eyes, you will see something spectacular, inventive, that you've never noticed before. Yeah, whether it's a street vendor, 
or it's a new way where locals have created a new type of bench or the way your neighbors have arranged potted plants to create a cubby hole or, a, you know, inventions all around in Southeast Asia. Yep. Yeah, I agree. And in India, oh my God, in India. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so basically you draw your inspiration from just simply looking yeah. around you. Yes. Yeah. Understood. Okay, sorry, I have to sort of read all the questions. Um, the next one would be, while celebrating openness and blurring the boundaries between interior or exterior, do you compromise personalization or security? Uh, no. If you go back to uh, the perimeter wall house, it's never about creating a 100% free boundary between inside and outside. That's very Western. I don't have a problem with kind of Corbusian connection between inside and outside, but we have to have a controlled boundary, right? Even the perimeter wall house has shutters that actually close at night, right? Um, so um, all of these boundaries are negotiated boundaries. They're never 100% free because we have thieves, prying eyes, stray dogs and cats, right guys? <laughs> so yeah. it has to be controlled, right? Nothing is ever pure, right? There's, we, we don't live in a fantasy world where everybody's friendly and happy, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to the next question would be, how do you make your drawings? What software or apps do you use? Um, Photoshop. <laughs> we basically build the most basic model. Uh, if it's simple in SketchUp, everybody knows SketchUp, right? Except me, I don't know. Mm, yeah. <laughs> the younger generation of my office built the model. I'm illiterate, right? Um, and after we do that, sometimes if we map the texture into, into, sometimes we map the texture or sometimes 3D Max and then we map the texture in, but you, most times, we don't map it. We actually Photoshop actual textures and people and animals and water because we feel that there is more of a hand to it. Even though it's on computer, rendering a texture and actually um, customizing a texture and putting it in Photoshop, for me, gives it that extra life. Um, yeah. And then we draw. Another important part is not even the architecture, but the context is really important. We make it a point to put in local people dressed in local clothes, right? Real local conditions. We don't clean things up. They're not minimal clean drawings. It's full of, sometimes if there's garbage and trash, we put that in. Um, we want to ex show authenticity of place, right? We don't want to present this kind of edited version of what Bangkok is. That's, that's, not, that's not interesting to me. Yes. And it's not real. Yeah. I agree. Photoshop is one of the best softwares that you can use to sort of personalize yeah. your own style and come up with your own graphic yeah, style. And okay, there's a quite there's three more questions. Um okay. Inspiring sharing, Mr. Chatpong. The thought process for the design inspiration sourcing you shared makes sense now as the projects are done, but did you encounter any challenges or inspirations that did not work in the end? I'm interested to know if there was any trial and error involved. Oh yeah, all of it. If anything, these, in, these designs result from trial and error. Um, the, the, the difference between the way I design now and when, when I designed before, let's say the house, uh, the first house is that before everything was done on the table or on the screen, we pre-planned everything. We had this vision and then we were going to force our way through with the contractor and the client to make sure that our original vision is built. We no longer think that way because learning from the locals and how they adapt 
when challenges and problems occur, that's where invention comes in. Um, so the innovation comes when an unexpected problem occurs and you have to switch and hack your plan. So now, in action, in, instead of looking negatively upon challenges, we look at it as a positive opportunity to create something along the way that is unique. Similarly to how the man in the yellow hacked two different boats to make a bridge, right? He probably didn't have a master plan where I'm gonna build these two boats and use them. He probably had boats first and improvise and say, hey, I don't have to build a bridge. Why don't I use a boat, right? So it's a different way of thinking. It's a more free flowing, less top down, more bottom up way of designing. That's riskier because you don't have a master plan or end product. But if you trust yourself to the process, something great will come out that's organic and authentic and also answers to life. Uh, hi, sorry. I think the host has disconnected, so I will continue the um, Q and A sure. session. So, um, next question: um, How do you start a project? Narrative, concept, find problems to solve, or do you explore possibilities? Um, when when I start, it isn't just each project just isn't in and of itself. I usually have a bigger plan. I think this is an important point where you should, you should have a big plan. When you start working, you should have an opinion about how life is in Thailand or in Malaysia or in India or in Indo Indonesia. It's always about looking at your context and see how you can improve it. Um, and then all the things that I explore are kind of subsets of that. Um, when I started exploring Bangkok Bastards, I was interested in the improvisational aspect, the problem solving aspect, but also the community aspects of all these Bangkok bastards because they're usually very small, compact spaces, spaces that are so small, but that actually forces you to share a space like an alley or a street. And in that sense, the communal aspect of Bangkok bastards, it's a, such an, a powerful thesis. And it teaches us that expensive architecture is usually the opposite. You usually put up walls and you enclose buildings in glass with air conditioning and life of the people of haves are separated from the have nots, right? The people living in the high-end condominium hardly ever speak to their neighbors nor to the people on the street because that's not what developers wanna encourage. They wanna create this hermetically sealed, high-end fancy air conditioned space. So Bangkok Bastards teaches us to blur that boundary in creative ways to make a better, more public community. So a th that's a thesis for me that kind of runs through all my projects. And for, for all of you graduating, I'm not saying you have to adopt this thesis, but you, are, you should have an attitude of why you're practicing architecture that's beyond being famous, beyond being published, beyond being winning awards but how does it actually affect real life outside of building? Yeah. And it doesn't have to, you don't have to build projects that are helping the poor, the disabled or the dis disenfranchised. Socially redeeming projects can happen in all spectrums from one star hotel to seven star hotels. There can be social theses, even in an expensive, high-end project, right? So I, right now, a lot graduating are saying, I wanna make an impact. I'm gonna help the poor and I'm gonna do these community work, but you don't have to pigeonhole yourself in doing one type of social work in terms of architecture. You can make the world better in doing projects for the poor, the middle income, as well as the enfranchised, right? Don't don't pigeon yourself, pigeonhole yourself in. Yep. 
Um, okay, so we are running out of time. So I'm going to ask the last two questions. Um, okay, so for now, the question is, how do you start a project? Is it a narrative concept? Do you find problems to solve? Or do you explore possibilities? Um, well, I'll go back again. I go back to the projects I just presented, right? Um, it's, it's also a perfect storm. There are projects I say no to as well because I'm not interested in them. Um, for example, um, I don't like to do big houses for rich people <laughs> with 20 bedrooms. <laughs> Um, but it doesn't mean I won't, I won't do them, but I'm attracted to projects that are linked to the uh, community, to the city, that have some impact in terms of the overall public um, realm. Um, so, and usually project, I, I begin with looking at my research first uh, to see how they can be applied, but also some projects come up and there's interesting context all around, vast, new bastards all around the context. So what happens is right now, I actually, the first phase of my contract, I have a research phase. So I've successfully been able to charge for a research phase because I think it's so important that, because most of the time developers or clients say, I'm gonna pay you, I pay you now, so you need to produce a design as quickly as you can. But sometimes, imagine the graduates who, who, who graduated, did you have thesis? All you can do thesis? No? You guys have thesis? No thesis. But in um, any case, even the um, studio project. Um, in our masters. Oh, in our masters. Well, even studio projects. How often when you're giving a prompt, do you say, okay, the next day I'm gonna produce a design? right? Don't, you need time to assimilate, study your context, study, study your clients, study many, many things so that design isn't just personal and internal, right? So starting each project, I usually need three months of research before I design anything. I ask for three months to do my bastard research. It's so important for us to fight for this fee. <laughs> Um, and, and show and educate the clients how important this research is. And I mean, I do it not because I'm academic, I'm not an academic person, but I feel like, um, especially in Southeast Asia where we don't document our subjects or our context, there's no quick notes that we can refer to to understand our context. We have to create it ourselves and analyze it ourselves before each project we begin. So that's, that's how I begin. Thank you so, so much for the answer. And so I think, I believe that's the last question for Mr. Chat. You can still ask questions and we will answer the rest at the end. But as I'm informed, Mr. Chat, you have to leave momentarily for something. Yeah, or will you, you and- I will try. <laughs> uh, if not, do you mind if we take a group photo now? Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Okay. So everyone, we would appreciate if you can turn on your camera to join for this photo. Yeah. Yeah, with Mr. Chat. <laughs> Okay, so is everyone ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so one, two, three. Okay, we take another one, last one. One, two, three. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Mr. Chat. Okay. Um, if yeah, if you are if you are leaving now, it's it's okay. Yeah, we will proceed with the second speaker for today. Thank you so much, Mr. Chat again. Um, we will proceed to the second speaker today, which is Mr. Anand Sonecha from C Lab. So yeah, 
let's give a round of applause to Mr. Anand to take the stage. So you, you can begin your presentation now. Thank you so much, uh, the entire team of Missing Scenes um, for generously inviting me and uh, it's a great pleasure to be the part of this discussion. And uh, uh, I also want to really congratulate uh, Chad and uh, I was very, uh, it was very good to know his work and how uh, life is very important in his work and how he takes uh, uh, inspiration from uh, daily things around, around us uh, that sometimes we miss out. Uh, it was very good to know how he interprets his own culture into his own works. So thank you very much, Chad. Um, so today I'm going to show two projects, uh, uh, but slightly more in detail. I think uh, uh, it's important that the students are there. Maybe it will help to understand the design process uh, of the project. Um, so two projects are Jai Jagat Theatre in Sabarmati Ashram. Uh, it's an amphitheatre project. Uh, another project is I'm going to show is the, uh, the housing for a community in Vastral. And uh, I chose this two particular project, which I thought that it will generate some discussions around the theme. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so just to give a sense about our practice, this is our studio in Ahmedabad. Uh, we started C Lab uh, in 2015 after working uh, for a few years at uh, Sangat at Professor Doshi's office and uh, uh, in Portugal with uh, Mr. Caesar and Castaneda. So we started uh, our office. This is during the pandemic time. Now we are back at the office, uh, uh, slowly uh, working on the projects. Uh, it was a difficult year uh, in India in particular. Um, so just to give a, a sense of where we are located, many of you probably don't know uh, Ahmedabad. So uh, this is the map of India. We are located, located on the Western part of India uh, in a city called Ahmedabad. Uh, I don't know if you might have studied in the history of architecture, there were many uh, architects who worked in Ahmedabad city, including Kobuzie Khan. Uh, and um, also, we have very uh, rich history uh, of uh, historical ar architecture in Ahmedabad. So it is a, it is a hub for uh, uh, traditional and modern architecture in, in India. Um, so uh, our city Ahmedabad uh, has a river called Sabarmati, which cuts across the city, uh, dividing uh, uh, the city into east and west. Uh, the eastern part, the old city is the world's heritage city. It was recently uh, commemorated. And uh, we are located on the other side of the city. And most of the projects are in and around Ahmedabad. Uh, so the two projects that I'm going to show today are, uh, are in Ahmedabad city. The first project I'm going to talk is Jai Jagat Theatre in Sabarmati Ashram. Uh, before I started uh, discussing about the project, I want to uh, sh share a history about this place because this is very significant place for our country. Uh, and um, uh, it will give a context about the place uh, and where we were working. So uh, I am sure that many of you know Mahatma Gandhi, uh, a very important person uh, for our country. And uh, he came to Ahmedabad city in 1915 and uh, he lived in uh, Kochar Bashram. Uh, in 1917, he established a community living on the river Sabarmati, the river that I was talking about that is di dividing the city into two parts. So he established a uh, community living on the bank of river Sabarmati and led the struggle for independence. So he lived uh, uh, in, the, in the place where we have worked for, for almost 13 years. He's lived from 1917 to 1913. And uh, one of this, uh, Breaking Salt Law was a very significant event for the struggle for independence that he started from, from the place that he was living um, in Ahmedabad. Um, also like uh, this was his house. So this is where he used to live uh, during the 13 years. So it's a very humble structure, uh, very simple uh, 
uh, space. So it has a large veranda and, and a, a room in the front. And there is a wall which divides the public and the private. So on the rear part, on the rear part is this courtyard. So it's a very domestic uh, scale and a very beautiful space uh, in which uh, the cooking area and, and the guest and his wife's room were there. And, and his room was this, and it was bare minimum. So this was, this was a photograph I've taken in the morning, seven o'clock. Uh, and and it's it's just uh, uh, a simple floor uh, which was local, uh, a whitewashed walls, and then uh, the the way he used to sit is on the floor with very minimal things. So I think it was very inspiring for for us to see how he he lived with such minimal resources. Um, and then uh, because. Uh, we were commissioned the work uh, uh, in this area and I was very interested on the history of this place because not much has been documented about how this place was before. So we started speculating uh, how uh, this place has evolved over time. So uh, I was really interested in knowing uh, its overall growth of the place. So uh, the speculative drawings uh, by talking to people, talking, uh, trying to read some historical text that we were trying to uncover that how this place was before. Uh, we started realizing that this was a barren piece of land uh, uh, and then uh, and Gandhiji, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, he, he chose this piece of land uh, 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 between the crematorium and Sabarmati jail. Um, and then there's some very interesting stories that we found out on the way that uh, he chose he chose this piece of land because as a, as a satyagrahi as a, as a as a person who is doing the struggle for independence either uh, uh, he will go to jail or either he will die so it's better to be in between so these are all some stories that we found out uh, by by studying this place and then it was very uh, organic this this um, there were these fields and this this uh, the edge of the river Sabarmati was not like form formalized. It was very it, it was like a uh, a very uh, nice uh, place. I'll show you in the next slide that how it has transformed. So this was the kind of uh, characteristic in 1918 uh, uh, when when uh, when he was starting to live here and he was living in one of these courtyard uh, houses. And then as the struggle for independence grew. Uh, also, many people around the country started coming here, and 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 many small structures, you know, started to form. So, so uh, in Gandhiji, uh, the house that I sh showed you in the previous slides was this one that he built. That that became like a uh, living space for him. Uh, this structure is called Nandini, where. Uh, uh, it was like a guest house where uh, other leaders from the country when they used to visit Gandhiji used to live here. Uh, this became like a uh, Udyog Mandir where uh, they used to uh, do spin wheel, the charkha. So they used to make their own uh, cotton and the cloth. Uh, all the young freedom fighters, they, they lived in this very interesting dome as a very beautiful structure. So it was like uh, a big courtyard and then, then the living around. And then there was a community kitchen where food for the entire ashram used to get cooked here in, in one place. And then the children who are living in this ashram, they were, they were the school, uh, they used to study here. And then uh, there was this uh, teacher's quarter. So teachers uh, were teaching in the school, they were living here. So it was like a small village. So over time it became uh, like, like a small village. Uh, this is the condition in 2017. Uh, so Gandhiji lived here for, for 13 years after he left this place and then uh, the followers who were living their generations and they lived here. And of course the city has grown and, and uh, now the condition of the place is like this. Now there's a big road which divides this ashram into two uh, big parts. Uh, there is a new, uh, there was a memorial museum which was built in 1960s uh, to commemorate the uh, life of uh, Gandhiji and it was built by uh, a very important Indian architect called Charles Korea. Uh, it's it's a wonderful structure. If you had a chance to see his work, I think I really encourage. Uh, so this was a very beautiful structure, like a veranda. It was built in 1960s, and then there was this uh, very recently strict uh, 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 because of new riverfront development. There was this huge 
wall that uh, uh, that was built you know dividing the the entire uh, space uh, which was very organic and, and the, it changed the relationship with the the river and i was i was also relating what chat was showing in his presentation about the walls and then we uh, and and, and uh, we are facing that consequence that uh, this compartmentalization even this ashram is um, is compartmentalized in uh, many ways so uh, this has been happening uh, very significantly in our cities so this uh, edge become very harsh and uh, 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 the relationship with the river drastically changed and then uh, there were this lot of trees which were grown i mean uh, over the period of time and there are some interesting stories so so these speculative drawings uh, also helped us to delve into uh, 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 this place in history and then we we are, we discovered many stories uh, uh, throughout and how people have contributed to, uh, to this place and uh, the project that i'm going to show so we have uh, worked on two projects so one is jay jagat theater which is uh, on on the on the other side of the road and very silent corner that we uh, worked and then this teachers quarters that i was saying that we uh, renovated them uh, in 2015 but i'll focus on jay jagat theater project and its process uh, so this project came because there are more than 1000 students uh, currently who are uh, coming from remote villages they are studying and living in sabarmati ashram uh, perform arts is a very important part of their education and they did not have like you know uh, a place for performance or practice they still there to travel large distances or rent places uh, to perform to make shows and you know to to even do practices there to log, uh, go to different places so so this project came into being because uh, because of this intention and also uh, in 2017 uh, ashram was celebrating 100 years of 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 uh, of the existence so uh, it was an uh, an event in which uh, people thought of the ashram that it should be like a gift for uh, to the children of ashram and neighboring communities this amphitheater so it is it should be a place of expression and togetherness so this project came because of of all the circumstances just to again orient you uh, uh, so this here is the river sabarmati uh, the the house uh, the hriday kunj where mahatma gandhi lived the initial photographs that i showed this memorial museum by charles korea and uh, number 16 is a place where we have built our uh, the, the amphitheater and this 15 is the volunteer house that we renovated so uh, when we were invited to work on this project we were said that this is the parcel of land that you to work uh, and you can choose uh, where you would like to locate the amphitheater built so so it is a very interesting uh, context so here number 2 is this uh, school uh, as i was saying that it is a very old school and still is functioning it's a very beautiful structure uh, there's this uh, number 5 is madam montessori school uh, in 1940s, there are stories that Madam uh, Montessori came here and she inaugurated this place. Um, there are no written documents to it, but then there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, of oral stories that uh, record that has been there. And 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 I I was reading that Mahatma Gandhi went to uh, London in 1931 for a roundtable conference, and that's where he met Madam Montessori, and he was very inspired by her. Uh, way of uh, education and and uh, he invited her uh, uh, here you know to to, uh, to do something about the education in the school so I, I i i could relate the story and i think that there is a a very interesting uh, historical uh, part of it uh, then there is a small uh, uh, library here where the books are there the teachers training college is number 7 so this was like a very uh, interesting context and then there are a lot of tall trees so these dots are like tall trees neem trees which are 80 90 years old so it has it has uh, uh, this pa this place was very raw in its nature and uh, generally you don't find this kind of uh, place in amdavad where everything is like nowadays paved and like formalized and this is this was like still like you you are in a village it feels it was a very nice place uh, this Neem tree has uh, so much history, uh, uh, and then the stories that uh, uh, one person called Totaram uh, uh, 
came uh, to ashram in 1920s and he asked Mahatma Gandhi that he would like to work with him and what he should do and Mahatma Gandhi just said that you should keep planting trees so for years and years he kept planting trees and uh, he used to water them from uh, river Sabarmati and today we, we are fortunate that uh, this trees becomes a part of, of the heritage and and uh, we have this serene environment that we have it's all thanks to him uh, so this was a kind of an environment and when i went there i felt that uh, whatever we do has uh, has to be very subtle because i think i uh, architecture is an act of destruction anyways and how do i uh, how do we do uh, something that uh, uh, does not uh, interfere in this uh, natural characteristic um, and parallelly, uh, again, uh, like these questions that were students were asking about the process, the, the design process is not a linear process. There's so many things happening parallel, you know, and also since I was also looking at uh, the, the type of theater for the first time, I also was very curious at how people throughout history have thought about it, you know. Uh, of course, uh, uh, looking at context and studying the context, but also there is a parallel study in which you're looking at how this typology has evolved over time and how people have thought about it. So just to like very briefly put what my studies were that uh, I, I felt that uh, Greeks were very careful about locating their theaters. Uh, there was always a collaboration between nature and, and humans. So they, 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 they were very strategic in, in locating. So this is a theater of Linus in southern uh, part of the Acropolis uh, in Greece and, uh, and, and I'm just Putting it very simply, I mean, there's a lot of other studies we have done, but I think that this was the essence that we have understood that uh, they were very, very careful about the place and how do they locate the theaters. Um, Romans were were slightly different. Of course, they, they were also uh, in many places they were inspired from Greek theaters, but they also had a very different ways of looking at the theaters. So they created their own landscape through the arches. So they, they created this landscape through those arches and they built the theaters as if they are an object in a plane. Uh, they, they used this plain terrain and they recreated the landscape and created the theaters in their own ways. So here, uh, uh, I felt that humans uh, dominated the nature. But in our culture, it was very different. Uh, I was also looking at uh, 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 in our culture, in the same time where when theater of Linus was built in fourth century BC, we also had this uh, 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 place of performance, but it was not as formal as uh, as, as as the Greeks and Romans had, like uh, seating and uh, stage, and you know. Uh, so, uh, so like this is the the place where Sita Bengra and Jogi Mara caves. And uh, there's this famous place, a poet, uh, uh, Kalidas, who wrote uh, Nekdut, a very important poem uh, in this place. And then uh, he, uh, and, and the, what I found out that uh, there was no formal uh, way of uh, performance. So it was just in nature. And all these steps that you see are later added. So it was just like a slopey terrain. And then there was this cave. And, and uh, there was this uh, place, it was a place of performance. And it was, uh, it was a very uh, uh, raw uh, place, you know, it, it had a blurred boundary between outside and inside and human and nature are equal. Um, and and uh, there were some interesting things that I found out uh, uh, compared. And then also like what I found out was that uh, in Greek theaters, uh, women were not allowed as a part of the performance. But in our, in our, in the culture here, women were the part of the performances. So it was so strange that nowadays it's the it's going back. No, I mean uh, culturally we were so different before, and now uh, things things have changed. So there are some interesting stories that we found out. Um, in 15th century Pal Palladio, also I was looking at the the later types. No, uh, that. Here I found it. This is Theatre Rompico and Vicenza. It was quite interesting that uh, um, that how he uh, used um, architecture as part of performance. So, uh, so this was this is the Theatre Rompico and Vicenza. So he created this uh, streets. Uh, so you can see. So this is the stage. Here's the seating and this this uh, streets which are creating in, in uh, perspective. It creates an illusion. So when you are sitting on the stage. Uh, you, uh, uh, he recreated the street, he recreated that nature that Greeks were 
uh, showing no and and uh, and because it was such a small space uh, he created this illusion to create this uh, uh, image of, of a big space or, or a street or, or, or a place so i i was very impressed that how he used architecture as a part of performance um, uh, whereas aldo rossi uh, this was a, a world pavilion uh, it was part of the bnl of venice um, and uh, uh, that structure which is floating uh, in water is the theater so uh, it, it 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 had a universal quality that wherever it traveled became the part of the place so it was very interesting to see how he thought the context itself uh, 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 in a very uh, meaningful way actually so um, coming back uh, again to the location that we were working uh, so uh, uh, this was the pass of land that we uh, uh, we were given and again you can see there is this series of compound walls that earlier it didn't exist and nowadays people have uh, you know started to compartmentalize the space so i was not really happy with what was there because earlier it was like a fluid space it was like a village that uh, you know uh, the place was one uh, but um, uh, this was the concern that we had in our hand and then uh, uh, this was the entrance, uh, so uh, I, I decided to build uh, on the corner uh, where you, from the entrance you don't see the theater at all, as if it is non-existent and you still have this long view of these tall trees and this uh, old structure. So uh, that was something that I decided that um, uh, from outside it's almost hidden, it's not visible, then slowly you discover when you come inside. Um, uh, and and also like the scale of the theater was very important because uh, 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 we were supposed to build for 300 uh, uh, people and and when I was studying of all the anthropometrics and basic spaces that we need uh, it was getting too high so that was something that I was I was not wanting that it should not feel that it's a very big structure and uh, so that's where we we looked at different options that how do we uh, have uh, a very simple uh, structure which is very human in scale. So we decided that uh, the structure should not go um, out of the earth, uh, 1.8 meters. Uh, uh, that should be the maximum that we should see from our side. So we decided that we'll sunk the theater partially below ground and we will partially above ground. So this section will just quickly uh, uh, make you understand the, the steps that we've taken. So this was like a, uh, there was a tree, there was this old structure. We decided to dig 1.8 meters below ground. And because we were going down and uh, there's rains here, uh, so water is going to get collected. So we thought that anyways, the water is going to get collected and we, do, we water is a precious resource here, which is because we are hot and dry climate, we should uh, collect it. So we made a huge tank, uh, underground tank, to collect water. Uh, uh, so what we did is we built a stage on the water tank, uh, and then uh, we had the seating. Uh, and then uh, from the entrance, you see only 1.8 meters, but when you come inside, it is 3.6 meters high structure. So it's a slow transition of, uh, of, of, of space. And uh, again, uh, because we were going down, we need to retain earth. So we had these walls and then uh, we were losing the connection with the ground because uh, we're going down and we are losing the connection with the surrounding. That's where we started creating big openings, strategically placed openings so that we uh, have point of views, uh, which, are, which we, we thought that were very important for the visual connections. And then we started adding uh, these elements that becomes a part of performance that what Palladio was also thinking, no, because the, the stage view has become the part of the performance. So we added this small balcony where, uh, uh, I don't know uh, if there's a show of Juliet and uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet show, they could use it or, or, or children can just stand and see the performance or, or they can have, uh, commemorate the audience by throwing the flowers. So it's like, a, uh, uh, so all the small elements we thought that could uh, enrich the experience of the, uh, uh, the performance itself. So then there is a ceremonial stair that we have added so that the performers can have this uh, a ceremonial entry. Um, 
and uh, the the geometry is very simple. Um, so it's like uh, uh, a spiral, which is uh, there's a ramp which takes you down. I, I'll come to this slide uh, later. So uh, there's a on one side there's a big stage. There's another uh, side is the seating, and then there is an alley through which the performers can just exit without audience seeing it. And then there is this big tank, which I was saying that was underneath the st stage, like 80,000 liters of capacity. Uh, um, and then this part, uh, this part I think was very important, this part where you arrive, uh, where you gather and then slowly enter to the stage. So this big gathering space, I think was, in my, uh, uh, in my opinion, was the most important uh, part of the place, because I think that that is our, that I was showing, no? the Sita Bengra and Jogimara caves uh, in our culture, there was this, big space which was free for interpretation it was it didn't have like a constant function it was it was just part of the nature so uh, i really like this place more than anything uh, in the design i think this is something uh, which which is the essence of, of our, our and of course this part is very formal and uh, there was a requirement in which uh, I, I was given a brief that there is a need of a formal performing space where also children would like to uh, have the performance in front of like 300 people, they need to build the confidence. So there were like so many other briefs that I was having then uh, I had to work with uh, other, other components as well. But this, uh, this part where you arrive, I think uh, is used in many ways. Uh, uh, they, they, so there's a big tree here. So it's used for outdoor classes, they eat here, they gather, they, then there's also like uh, other performances that I'll show in the next slides. So uh, from this gathering space, there's this very narrow space through which you enter. Uh, so this ramp takes you down slowly uh, and then the whole structure uh, is uh, uncovered. So just to quickly show the section. So this is the uh, exterior part. Uh, so 1.8 meters. And then this is where you have the full extent of the theater. And this is the water tank that I was, I was talking. Uh, then this journey to reach the theater was also very important. So we created like this, uh, because there's a lot of students. So uh, we created this uh, path uh, made up of brick. And then there are these pause spaces because uh, children can sit and they can also read. And uh, other time of the day, I think there are a lot of children here. So they can use these pockets to, 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 uh, to use this. And then there's this gathering space, I was saying, uh, arrival space, and then slowly you enter this into this place. And this is the photograph after this pathway was built. So it's seamless. Uh, uh, we chose brick as a material and then it's only 2.5 centimeters we kept above the ground. So it is it is almost flushed uh, with the surrounding. So the pathway is somewhere here uh, that you can see. But this characteristic of this place, I really felt that we wanted to retain. So uh, anything that we do should be uh, critically done. And then slowly when you uh, uh, move forward, this gathering space comes in and then slowly the, the theater is revealed. Uh, and then this is like a, um, a, a, a white wall uh, where it suggests that there is an opening. It's, it's, it's just very silent. Uh, there's no openings you can see from, uh, uh, from outside. And then these tall trees takes over everything. Um, so, and this is the gathering area. And then when there is performance, you understand that there's something happening inside. So it will draw you in. So you can see that people are sitting there uh, and then you can see the scale that is not very, very big from outside. And then slowly it take, pulls you inside uh, and then the whole space is uncovered. Uh, and, uh, and then when people occupy this place, it becomes more meaningful. Uh, and, and, and I think that uh, this, this place is uh, completely transformed. Uh, and this openings that I was saying that was stretched strategically put were like from the stage, you can still see this school. Uh, then there are these events that uh, this balcony projects in, uh, that people from that opening can also see, uh, who, does, who do not want to see the performance uh, in its entirety, they can see the performance there. So it has many different possibilities. So you can see, uh, uh, how people uh, use this space actually, and someone peeping inside like this, and someone use this opening, or and and people use it in very different ways. And then uh, this narrow alley becomes like a 
uh, a place where the performers also hide themselves no and then they can exit and so it's not a very formal kind of a theater that we see but it still uh, has some uh, purposes and then uh, people uh, use it in a very different way and then of course there are some other things that uh, you also want to uh, look at it when i came to the site this water tank in concrete was a very strong element uh, present on the site there were no trees so i also felt that i want to celebrate that and i want to remember it that this is also existing even if it is far we created this opening just to uh, commemorate it and also of course uh, when you are working it's not something uh, 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 as 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 chat also was saying that you see so many things daily and and you uh, you you it stays in your subconscious mind and when you draw i think uh, consciously or unconsciously it comes you know so i think this uh, so this is like a staircase in fatehpur sikri it's it's a beautiful complex uh, in in near delhi uh, uh, you should have you should look if you get a chance uh it's a beautiful complex um uh, it was abandoned uh, because of the scarcity of what is very interesting history and i when i went there i was very impressed with this staircase and and how it, uh, it brings in from one level to another and this crown and the scale of door and and you know uh, so i was very inspired and and when i was drawing this uh, jay jagat theater when i was thinking about how uh, a ceremonial staircase where children will also come in uh, so i was i, I was i was also thinking about for the possibility stay but i i felt that i want to interpret in my own way uh, then uh, uh, this staircase was built in stone uh, it needed this support of tread and riser the material here i was using it differently the concrete so i could get rid of this uh, in between elements so then it became something else and then this uh, crown that also celebrates at opening so so of course um, it also sisa also says that when you work you are also working with uh, 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 so many things that you have registered over time and uh, and, and and history uh, uh, and then you try to interpret uh, in your own way in in the time that you are working with different materials and circumstances so yeah so these are like some of the photographs that i'll quickly uh, go through so uh, and and this uh, scale of openings also we work thinking about children that uh, it should be of the scale of children so all the openings that you have made is like uh, as thinking on children and then it becomes the it becomes their place and they use it in many many different ways so uh, uh, and we are fortunate that alwar cesar wrote about this uh, amphitheater if anybody has chance to see please uh, we can read about it i'm going to quickly show a second project uh, uh, a housing project uh, that we have been working on since the last 3 years um, uh, um, so there are like uh, 65 uh, billion people in india live in in, in adequate uh, shelters uh, so they are called slums and it makes 17% of the world population who lives in such conditions and just to put in perspective it is the entire population of britain actually so um, affordable housing is a serious challenge in india and in 1960s and 70s uh, professor doshi and charles korea and many other architects have worked on this issue fundamentally and uh, and then showed showcase uh, that how uh, we can also look at uh, uh, at the communities here uh, and and i also feel that uh, uh, our profession nowadays is focusing on only a particular segment of the society which is 3% and and what was discussed before that uh, as a professional you need to work at different uh, user groups not on this or that uh, so uh, the, in india there is a big problem at this moment that um, uh, that we are focusing on on very uh, particular society and many people who uh, the rest 80% 90% do not have any access to architectural services neither they can afford or neither they have any clue about that, that there is a profession like this that also can work. so i think uh, this was a great learning experience for us working on this project so uh, in 2018 an ngo uh, uh, and an university called the world for university approached us to uh, design a, a housing for a community who were affected with leprosy disease uh, and it flooded in monsoons and leprosy disease as we know that it has affected people from ancient times 
even this greek physician wrote about it and even in our treaties uh, uh, our indian treaties that uh, susrasta he also wrote about this disease in 400 bc and throughout this this history there was a stigma around the disease that people were not allowed to live in the city they were always treated as outcasts and they were supposed to be uh, living outside of the city um, and people with leprosy were marginalized uh, treated as outcasts and were forced to live in dedicated asylums uh, till recently uh, post independence many uh, people who were affected with leprosy migrated from different parts of of uh, of india and they settled in amdavad uh, and the community that we are working with uh, is the largest in amdavad uh, where it has uh, 125 homes and more than 500 people living currently in dilapidated condition and their conditions were like this uh, during monsoon it always flooded and the reason is uh, simple that uh, uh, the 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 location where the community is located so this is the road there is a canal which passed through and then there is a slope which uh, gradually goes down from road to the community is 1.5 to 1.8 meters and and due to the uh, surrounding development there is this strict compound wall which came and this community became like a saucer uh, so if if this is the canal this is the slope uh, there is new development around and there is this strict compound wall which came around and this community became like a saucer so there is no way the water could pass uh, earlier it was an outskirts of the city and now it became the part of the city and recent development uh, and then the, and uh, there is no way uh, the water could pass the rain water could pass uh, so um, just to give a sense of this place so this is the there is a main road there is this uh, sorry this is the main road this is the canal uh the slope which i was talking is always like in this direction uh there is this compound wall which is surrounding the community and there is a newer development which has happened over time and earlier this place was uh in a, as an out, outskirts so the water used to just pass uh, it was as like big fields so they used to pass but now uh, with this new development there is no way the water could pass and there is no uh, infrastructure of drainage and other things so it was a very complex project and of course uh, uh, the budget was very limited i'll get to that part quickly uh, uh, and and uh, with the community we identify like 55 houses which were in bad condition which were below the street level uh, did not have like proper living conditions were identified by the leaders of the community that needs immediate uh, rehabilitation uh, so far we have built uh 12 houses uh, we are going to be more in coming years but again uh this was like a pilot project where things are being tested so uh, uh initially when we were approached we were asked to design two houses from the community uh, as a pilot project uh, uh and and we were given uh, a very fixed budget to work was uh, 4500 euros by five yeah around five thousand dollars uh, it's 4 lakh rupees, which is like a very strict budget. Uh, it's very difficult to build something uh, on this budget in India, even here at this moment. Uh, it has to be flood resilient. It should improve natural light and ventilation. The houses should be incremental and engaging contractors, fabricators from the community itself, uh, so that whatever we, money we put goes back to the community. It doesn't uh, count. So that's, this was some of the design concerns initially have been established. So first house that I'm going to show is a house for Narsama and her family. So it is marked in red here. I'm sorry, Mr. Anand, just to remind you, there's five minutes left. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this was the condition of the house. Uh, there was no light and ventilation. You can see there was no proper uh, condition of living. This roof was made up of as asbestos, uh, which also not not very good in, in, in terms of uh, health and also Ahmedabad gets really, really heated at 50 degree, 48 degrees, 49 degrees. Uh, so what we did was uh, we demolished the house. So this was the existing house, which was flooded uh, almost 30 to 50 centimeters. We demolished the house. We raised the plinth uh, after studying different uh, conditions uh, around. Uh, we built like two spaces, one uh, living space 
a cooking space is just enough for a person to stand and cook and the courtyard uh, so there is cross ventilation and there was this very nice tree so uh, cross ventilation was very important and then we thought about the foundation in a way that they could in increment uh, in future if they want to uh, add one room and we 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 took the inspiration from the existing structure itself you know so there was this one room a bathing area and a tree and a courtyard in the back so we just uh, modulated the structure in a way that uh, it has a courtyard a big uh, a, a, a big door which opens to this uh, very small kitchen that becomes an overlapping space from the courtyard a very simple space and we also uh, use the doors and windows from the existing house. We use the debris. So whatever we used, we could, you know, reuse, we, we used. And these floor tiles, as you can see, uh, are also uh, made by people of the community by uh, making it through waste marble dust and white cement. We added the pigment and we made these tiles. And this is the courtyard. Um, very simple structure. And these doors are also locally fabricated and this is a very funny story that I'm going to share uh, in the next slide. So uh, this was before uh, the construction and this was uh, after. And we, we draw some <laughs> these jallies and we took it from the neighboring house and it becomes a part of it. It doesn't feel. And we also had the skill development workshops, uh, three workshops that we had. We invited different professionals. They taught different skills to us and also to the community. So this is the tile making workshop that we had. And then people from the community started making tiles for their own houses. And this in this house, uh, you can see that. Uh, and then also there was this change in communication technique that we had to, because we are trained to make drawings in very particular way in the schools. But the contractor that we were working had no idea how to read the architectural drawings. So we started making models with all the dimension in it so that it uh, quickly helped uh, him to build the house rather than having like 2D drawings, which is very hard to imagine. So this was uh, something that we also developed. Uh, this drawing that I gave uh, to the fabricator because he was saying that he knows how to read the drawings. So I said, great, uh, I gave him this drawing and uh, this dotted lines shows that how do you open the door, right? And he thought it was a structural member and he made something like this. So I was very angry initially that, uh, you know, what have it is such a big mistake. And then I understood that we had to change our way of communicating architecture even. So whatever we give or draw or whatever is has to be like bare minimum. And, and, and then I, then we accepted this as, as a pattern and then we flipped this door and, and become the part of it. And for all the houses, we repeated the same mistake because uh, this was becoming an identity now. So as you can see, other doors also we use the same thing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, we also changed the communication techniques for uh, communicating with the users also. Initially, they were not uh, able to conceive architectural drawings. So we started photographing their belongings, started putting inside of the models and communicating. So this was uh, something. I think I'm running out of time, so I'll not uh, go into the details of the other houses, but I'll just flip the slide so you can have a quick look. So this was another house for Aruna. So you can see that she's walking on the street and the house is below street level. And there were like six members living in four, mem four meters by six meters of the house. So we, uh, we thought uh, of a house of two story, but in a way that it does not become very overpowering to the street that we off off offset it from the street and uh, it becomes a part of the street. And then we added this ferro cement roof and a loft where children can sleep uh, also. And then people can do it in very different ways like steel roof or concrete roof or anyway. So it's a very basic house, a, a small cooking area where they use for cooking in the morning, use it in the night for sleeping. And, uh, and, uh, and it opens up to this big, uh, open space uh, that it, it uh, extends the whole house. So you can see that this is uh, this is the house now. This door opens up completely and it becomes a part of this open space. This is the loft that I was talking um, and these tiles and other things that uh, people from the community made. This is the ferro cement staircase also, which was made. To be honest, uh, uh, people from the house did not like these big doors because they thought that this is 
it is invading and uh, and 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 uh, while doing this project i we also get criticism some things they don't like it and some things they like it but i think it's a great learning process and there is a lot of discussion and negotiation because natural light and ventilation is important that that's what we do not compromise even if they need more space uh, but and also working with like very limited budget i think uh, there are some choices that you make and uh, is another house uh, for an old grandmother. Uh, she goes, she makes her living out of begging on the street. So uh, the house was in a very bad condition before and we just made like one small room and a cooking area and this two courtyards in the rear front in the rear it likes a veranda. So the house ventilates. So it's a very simple house uh, again. So yeah, so these are like some of the uh, uh, different iterations we made in the in the in the in the community, and we are still working on it. And each house is unique, and we are learning from each house, and we are improving uh, step by step. Uh, so it's not like a one prototype that we made and just repeated, because the family structure is very different. Uh, people are already living in the community, so we take the inputs, see the uh, family structure, and then with the budget of four lakh rupees. We had to work, uh, but uh, we tweak uh, uh, certain things and uh, work with some some logic. But uh, they 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 have their own meanings. So thank you so much for patiently listening this. And I'm sorry that I took more time uh, uh, than I was. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very inspiration sharing session, Mr. Anand. Thank you so much. Um, I have one question at the top of my head right now. You mentioned about criticism, and I feel like how do you as an architect deal with criticism? Do you um, convince your client to, uh, to sort of like it, or do you continue to amend it to their liking? Thank you for this question. I think criticism is positive. No, I think uh, it means that we need to improve on certain things. Like uh, uh, when we built these two prototype houses, uh, people from the community did not say anything uh, when I was showing them the design, uh, initial design uh, sketches and models and drawings. They were, they were feeling that they were, they were obliged that they are getting the house and they should not speak up. And, and I, I felt that it should have been the opposite. Uh, and I did not understand uh, this dynamics. And then only after the houses were built, I was also observing how the, it is being occupied. So storage was not working, other things were not working. So many things I found that it is not working in the way I've conceived. And then uh, we started uh, changing the way of communication and we slowly had these long meetings in the community and, and talking about that uh, we have to speak up uh, only mm -hmm. then we can uh, change and then people's and also it is about building relationship no because i was also new in the community at that time and slowly by working and going very regularly i i made the relationship so that they could talk freely and then after a point they they also started criticizing the work which i really admire uh, because i think that's the starting point to also improve so some things I changed some things I debated with them. Like for example, they were saying that uh, these courtyards are useless spaces uh, and they do not work courtyards. That's where I had to have long discussions with them that they are necessary for natural light and ventilation and we will not compromise on that, you know, even mm. if we need more spaces. Uh, or for example, storage spaces, we changed uh, some things. Or even uh, after a point, we also started changing the typology that some, uh, we started looking at houses uh, and bringing light from the top. So uh, some things uh, I think that uh, we took at a, took as a criticism and 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 evolved and improved. Certain things uh, there was a debate and discussion in the community that some things are important. Natural light and ventilation will not be able to compromise even if you need bigger space. No, because I completely understand the other perspective that the one room is not enough. For, uh, for for people, you know, and they need more space. And then we have this constraint of budget, you know, so how much basic we, we can provide at the same time, uh, other things. So it's it's a very difficult project in, in a way uh, to, to look at the aspiration and the needs and also to work with the economics part. 
uh, so some things uh, uh, are negotiated also. Okay. Are negotiated also. Thank you so much for your answer. So now um, I would like to move on to the Q and A's from the audience. Um, yeah. Wait a minute. Okay. So here, um, I'll speak through this, the questions. Um, the first one would be, um, I notice a lot of sketch-like conventions. Do you feel more comfortable communicating your ideas through sketches? Uh, I, I think uh, it depends on the circumstances. Like uh, uh, when, uh, when I was working on J Jagat Theater, we, we were communicating ideas to drawings and models. Uh, uh, and, and many times drawings because uh, the person who I was dealing with has certain understanding to read architectural drawings. So that was fine. But in the community housing project, drawings uh, didn't make any sense actually that uh, this contractor could not read architectural drawings, neither he could read working drawings. So that's where we had to change our uh, technique or for the school for the blind project that we also have worked where uh, drawings are used uh, uh, to communicate architecture and it depends on visual ability right and then when, when we're working on school for the blind project uh, the visual ability is not there and how do you communicate uh, drawings then so that's why we also started looking at tactile drawings so i feel that with each project uh, you have to understand the users and uh, and then and, uh, and act accordingly so so far our process is not being similar for each project uh, uh, we, we adapted uh, to different circumstances just to make sure that there is a dialogue uh, in the process uh, uh, so users can be involved in the design process as well. Yes, I very, very much agree with that. Moving on to the next question. Um, how do you find the balance between historical, cultural and also religious elements in your design? Do they all happen simultaneously or one supersedes the rest? It's a difficult question, but um, I think that when you're working, as I was saying no, before that, uh, you gather so many references of history, your readings about the sea, the way you see things around. And, and, uh, and I think Caesar has written very beautifully that architects use, uses history to renovate architecture. They do not discover anything new but they just transform reality. So I believe in that also. I think that I, I think that uh, this is very uh, true, no? I mean, uh, that uh, we do not invent things, no? But we gather so many things that we have seen around and then uh, in your mind, somehow it stays. And then when you're drawing, I think uh, consciously sometimes and sometimes unconsciously it comes out, no? I mean, when I look back some of, my, of the work, then I say, okay, no, I've seen this place. That's why this place was like this. And I remember that uh, uh, Professor Doshi always used to encourage us that uh, to draw what we like and what we don't like. So wherever we go, so uh, we were always told to keep a sketchbook and a measure tape and, uh, and a pen. No, so we uh, we always have to register what we liked and we have to write about it why we liked uh, a sp particular space or why we didn't like. So I am sure that. Uh, there are so many uh, references uh, uh, that uh, comes out when you're working, but I, I, I cannot say that uh, this or that, you know, that uh, this has influence or that has influence. I think that so many things, so many circumstances uh, uh, influences your design process. And, and it's a complex thing. I, I don't think it's a linear process. It's so many things are happening in your mind simultaneously while you're working. Understood. That was a very nice answer. And okay, sorry, I have to rush to the next one. Um, what do you think about the future of architecture in India and how will it look like in 10 years? I have no idea actually how to answer this question because I'm also still working and learning and trying to discover things on my own. Um, but as I was saying that um, uh, our profession is... Uh, I don't know, focusing on only two or three percent of the society. And, and we really want to also look at the other uh, percentage of the society, not to say that you want to only do this or that, you know. Uh, so we are looking at all different kinds of typologies. What also Jack was saying, you know, that you don't want to uh, 
uh, get into one thing that uh, and keep working all of your life. You also want to explore different dimensions of architecture, but not forgetting the large component of uh, of the population which who has no access is so. So that's where at least our practice uh, we really want to focus on on the on the communities who do not have accesses and what to like to work for them as well. Uh, not to say that uh, our focus is this or that, you know, we want to work on broad spectrum. Uh, we also do installations, we also do institutions, but also looking at the basic of the basic house. So we would like to broaden our perspective into that. And I hope that uh, our profession in India at least uh, also broad broadens up that uh, and brings this discussion to the community. Yeah. Understood. And okay, this one question said, beautiful drawings. Um, I recognize the huge implementation of proportionality. How long did it take for you to be used to remembering these measurements? I don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> so since I was a student, I, we maintain the diaries and whenever we travel, we keep drawing. And we, even daily life we keep drawing and i don't know some sometimes it becomes inherent no? that uh, uh, when you visit a place uh, when you like it you try to understand why you like it and then when you start it's not only about measuring things but also understanding the atmosphere uh, what constitute that space the surroundings uh, the the climate the material the people no i mean life itself so there are so many other components also constitute the space measuring is one part which formalizes your understanding of the dimension of of the space the proportion of the space that okay this width and this height and this sort of opening uh, in this direction gives a sense of this quality you know like uh, i don't know it's a it's a very personal again understanding of it so so yeah i think uh, 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 I, I i measure things to, to understand the scale of it. Because when you see things, uh, when you register things, there are cert certain things you, you get, but certain other aspects of the scale itself sometimes miss out. And I think that with uh, experience, my, you might start comparing that, okay. Uh, and, and I use some references always to compare uh, my own space to, let's say, wherever I go. So five times my own space is this space, you know? So something that I always keep in my mind. Uh, just to register the proportion of it. I'm sorry, I don't know if I answered this question. It's, it's difficult, actually. It's a tricky question. Yeah, I hope the audience who asked this question understands. And yeah, moving. I think we have to sort of move. Um, I'm going to ask one last question. Um, okay. Okay. It's going to be from this anonymous. Um, amazing sharing, Mr. Anand. I think I noticed that there were people sitting on the tall wall. Was that a culturally ergonomic consideration before the design? Or was it the people's culture, the locals' behavior that kind of molded that usage? It's a good question. Actually, I didn't think while I was working. It was just an opening that I thought that uh, <laughs> I would like to create uh, to just see the... Montessori school, no, because that was an that was an intention, and then how people adapt uh, to this. Actually, I've not shown some videos. There were some very interesting videos, and how children have uh, you know made this as like a playground. They use this uh, hide and seek, and they use uh, this amphitheater, and uh, as if it's a playground. So uh, many things when you when you work, I I don't think that you intend or you thought that okay this could be used like that, but then when people use it, it becomes more meaningful. And sometimes you it you also are amazed by how people have uh, adapted uh, the use, and this uh, constantly inspires me actually. So that's something that um, I feel that without people, there's no architecture, no. And what also Chat was saying that how life is important, like in his courtyard. Uh, so I think that this uh, amphitheater is is. Uh, useless uh, if there are no people inside so uh, and I think that how when people use it it becomes more meaningful and then people use it in their own way and they are comfortable about that space that's why they are sitting like this or they're hanging like that you know so uh, I think that uh, architecture uh, serves as a backdrop to celebrate uh, these activities I feel 
True. Thank you so much again, Mr. Anand. I really appreciate the time taken for, to share this very beautiful presentation. I'm so sorry that we had to cut your presentation quite short, like you, you didn't get to share your videos, but I learned a lot from this session. I hope the participants did too. So now we will move on to our very final speaker for today, uh, Mr. Real Rich Sharif on the tangible and intangible aspects of architecture. Thank you again, Mr. Anand. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. Let's put it here first, okay. Okay. I'll just start to share the presentation. Please present and then share screen. Okay. Okay. Okay, shall I start now? Yes, yes, okay. you can start. Uh, I think uh, today I have learned so much from uh, Chad and Anand. Uh, from Chad, I learned about the, the city patterns and uh, predictable vernacular might inspire the work of the architects. And then from Anand, it's still like a very sensitive approach. And I'm kind of asking myself, and how do we reflect on our work through the sensitiveness of the, um, the how we touch the methodology is very damn important. Uh, I'm very touched of the Atman's word and the sensitivity of the culture that he brings. Is a, I think uh, somewhere, if there's a chance, I think uh, I'll be happy to touch the ground and see it. Anna, it's very nice. Okay, I will uh, present the, the 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 talk about the tangible and intangible. Is the term uh, come up from the uh, the from Lee and the friends? I think uh, they asked for the tangible and intangible. So as I'm asking for myself, what's the intangible? I'm I, I'm I'm trying to divine the missing scenes. Actually, <laughs> the missing scenes probably can be divine as an attempt to reach a project to push are usually designed to acknowledge diverse contexts. I put some of the words like a generic and diverse, revolving heavily around the project existing culture and community. Uh, I was thinking that the way to push the boundary can be seen as a two way of thinking. The tangible that can be defined as something you can see is an impression of what you can perceive in a solid form of reality. You can identify it from the senses, uh, like uh, your ear, your ear, eyes, your nose and your mouth. And the other thing is intangible. The forces that make you understand that the power of idea has unlimited limit of critical and creative thinking. It's a way to reconcile yourself, um, to be open mind, and to uncover to uncover bricolages. This is quite interesting that the tangible can be defined as a something you can see. Is is impress is is the senses. The tangible starts from outside your realm to understand that there are greater forces than yourself. So it's it's outside. And the intangible is inside. It's unpredictable of your mind. Perspectives, if you are ready, then the future will be cross-disciplinary, an attempt to push bricolage. So the disclaimer is, I see the hermits sometimes. When I see them, I'm stammering, feels a bit dizzy when the hermit comes, but I'm excited to see it more and more. So I'm trying to find what the hermit is. From uh, what uh, the conclusion of, uh, uh, I mean, my, my experience is quite not so much, you know, it's only like a 10 years of practice. So, but uh, in, 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 in seeing the hermits, uh, I think it's very important to see the conclude what we can see around us. Uh, I start from my father. My father is a trained uh, structure engineer and lovely leader. You see, he's like a Tarzan in front of the forest with the craft leader. And he has a connection with the many crafts leaders uh, and still working with me. 
and they're still working with me for until now. Experience like a 30 years experience. So that's uh, un, un, the, the, the the experiences in the Indonesian uh, in pre-independence until the post-independence until now. So my house, this is my house, my father's house. I experienced uh, in the childhood in Surabaya. What chats explain, the house is near Gangdoli where the rich and poor lives. Normal and crazy people. I get a friend with the crazy people, literally crazy, crazy kids. That's always smiling, like a place while smiling and opening your, your clothes, things like that. And where the prostitutes wanders in the daylight trying to survive. And I get along with all the kind of people. So I found out that not only the architecture is important, but the people inside is very important and they are like having a survival. So I was texture itself is uh, excited because I can play with in, in my father's workshop area in Surabaya. It's a full of tools. And, but uh, during uh, like a once in a year or twice in a year, my father will gather all of the craftsmen just to sit down and carry and together. And it's a spirit of togetherness. And like uh, eating together, like uh, talking until the night time is 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 like a uh, coloring my my life. I so in in my process of learning, I, I got lucky to get uh, uh, accepted in the Foster and Partners. Is I think it's a superior high technology process. So I I call it superior high technology process because I it was very privileged. I mean working with them. It's, it's, it's high technology because it's cross-disciplinary already. And it's also uh, very, uh, very talented uh, engineers over there. And we did it in the conceptual stage, not in the later stage, because in conceptual stage, we have the privilege to talk with the construction uh, engineers, with the mechanical, electrical plumbing, and all of them to provide the, how the integration between a cross field is, uh, uh, is, is, the, is the, like, uh, the, the breadth of the architecture. At the beginning of the experimentations, it's crazy. <laughs> How can we we practice like that in Indonesia? <laughs> we don't have that kind of superior high technology process. What we have here is low technology. We don't like a very uh, it's not too skillful engineers, but I think we can have it quite right. And I start with uh, my parents' house when I practice. Asia. I start uh, to like. Uh, uh, conquering my my parents' house. So until the time that my parents asked me to leave, because oh you you're obviously getting bigger and bigger than the time you leave, and you see that number two one two three is my workspace. Number ten is the designer space. Number four is the designer space. Number six the administration space. My wife is a dentist. She helped the administration. You know the dentist is very strict. He will drill your, your teeth if you are not following her. But I think it's good for having a discipline as an architect. You know, Number seven is the, our shared kitchen where everything goes there. Very beautiful things. When my mom is like a very uh, proficient on the cooking. So this is the mezzanine floor. And you see all of this, uh, the, the complexities of the gated community and the high rise, you know, in the, in the between of the low rise, it's, it's, it, had, it has a gap, you know, and there's not like a backlog of a housing. We need to provide housing, but of course, uh, our house is limited and I'm uh, I'm just looking off some of the keywords at the time, like a craft integrations. How is, is there like a, if there is no space for experiments, how can we read the book? I mean, it's like a, like a, our escape point. How we define experimentation and how, how is the pattern looking outside the Jakarta, or even we make a community called the Made in Jakarta, just to, in, in Chad's uh, way of thinking, it's like a bastard <laughs> pattern, how we can divide a bastard, bastard. And there is a wedding on the street because we don't have a road, but the culture is the, we, they, they, they did the wedding on the street and they blocked the road. It's a vernacular thing of tradition that makes our life as a life. But uh, I found out the for Sophia, Sophia said, it's a philosophy, <laughs> Sophia. Sophia said, you just have to love it first. Have a belief that you are unique. It doesn't Sophia when you, you have thinking like that. You have to love it first. You have to digest it first. It's the hermit of Sophia. They always ask you to love yourself and love your thinking and just believe on yourself. And there are limitations of experimentation. I mean, that's what, what I remember. And this 
uh, office room keep changing all of the time. And then uh, by changing all of the time, we did have some of modular structure outside the garden and we, we made the modular structure for the students uh, so they can learn with the studio. So there are like a limitation of experimentations. Is, the, is, is there like a three act, like an act to decrease the volume of material used, to ease the construction by, by the craftsman, and to lighten the building materials. And that kind of uh, three modules, like uh, experimented in here, is like connection with the adaptive fiber constructions using a small joinery bolt, and we provide like a space. So using a very simple method, like a bookshelf, so we can create such a structure called architecture. <laughs> And then, and then uh, this is our, our first end house uh, called a very minimalist. It's a actually simple house. It's unpretentious because it's like concrete washed. It's a very a, a low cost in terms of the elevations. It's a cross elevation, appropriate lighting, and the most important is happy client. Demanding for the restless architect. <laughs> so I have to work in there. Is uh, much of time, you know, uh, doing a supervision and but. At the end, it's, it's a simple functional house. Three bedrooms, uh, one foyer, and you enter the like a three levels foyer, and then you can see the all of the living rooms uh, looking at. So it's facing on the north, south, and east because the west is like uh, blocked by the wall because it's, it's very hot. So when you see that it's a, a simple house, it's a pre pretentious, and then it's, it's becoming, uh, the wind tunnel is very, uh, uh, is uh, not accidental, but I think it's a part of the uh, in iteration. So until we get this kind of small void, not too big and not too not too small, and we can have the the the, the physical uh, stacking effect coming to the side. So it's the first uh, air stacking effect technique that we use in the projects in the tropical housing climate. Uh, so we put the, all of these things into these projects. It's, it's called the multiple scarlet house. Uh, it's a evocative light world house. <laughs> it's a cross air ventilation gain. There are like a question of components archetypes, like a tapered, uh, tapered uh, pattern using like a vernacular patterns, like uh, punching the, the, the top because you can use a group. So there are like a combination of local patterns, but I, I don't see my reference is quite clear at the time. So I kind of get the inspiration for many, many uh, inspirations. So it's bringing like the houses like that. So it's like a multiple boxes uh, combined with multiple sky skylights. And it's a sequential. Uh, 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 you cannot, you can, you can, the, from the outside can see, can, from the inside can see outside, but the outside cannot see inside. So this is from the outside, from the inside. So we can still see the transparency and it becomes like a spacious and pretentious space. The, uh, Pretty doesn't need to have like a raw material, like a whitewash. And pretension space is like a, the space that makes client happy without any uh, uh, further effort, I think. So I think it's, it's one of the things that's uh, to define this a big window is very important for our studio. It's still very big and very, uh, you know, with using a minimal hinge. This, I think, is uh, the power of the architecture itself because we can, when we put the, all of these membranes and the hinge, and then and and then uh, and then weld it. It's become uh, the one of the main feature of the house, and still it's unpretentious, and it's happy client, <laughs> and the happy client is very important. So, uh, so this is the the video of the house. Uh, I don't, but I think it's it's not too needed. I, I because the time is limited. I think I'll just skip it. Um, okay, please wait. It, it's, Ah, uh, this one. Then the hermit comes. <laughs> the, the the second hermit. So I kind I kind of have a, like the second. Uh, the the hermit is comes from the Plato's and Aristotle. The Plato said it's a rationalism that you need to have for something new all of the time, and the Aristotle said, oh, there is nothing new under the sun. Is this uh, this all of these two streams is like a. Uh, integrating and becomes there are like a little man in the middle is the Kronos is a hermit of that. so then these three hermit uh, create together into two hermit and it becomes has a conclusion of the fourth hermit so the first hermit is the Sophia the second hermit is the Techne 
The third hermit is the phronesis. The fourth hermit is the episteme. The episteme is the knowledge of the overall when you can evaluate. It's become like a writing. It's become like a book. It's become like a total effort. When the first hermit is the Sophia, is the way that you love architecture so much until you can die for it. It's it's the it's the, it's the dedication to be mission, to have a mission. With with I think from the Anand presentation we can see uh, Gandhi and Anand motif is to to have a sensitive approach in the architecture. Hot warm. The third uh, hermit is a techne. Techne is the part of when you know how to do it, and you have to do it. You you know it. It's like a, you riding bicycle. But you know it, and you you want you can do it straight away. But the phronesis is very important. It's the way that you can tactical tactical transactions. <laughs> it's the way of the kampung transactions. It's the way of the many of participations method. Phronesis is the heart of the when you can appreciate the human's life in terms of architecture. So drive more into these four hermits. So this is uh, the, the, the vernacular architecture in Indonesia. So we can say this is like a, the combinations of between the phronesis, episteme. It's become as episteme already because it's, it's, it's been evaluated and it's, it's around the but, but during the time when it's created, pro probably it's just a process. So it's just a technical, including like a stacking the stone. It's like a technical things. So it's become a technique. After the technique, it's become like over and over with the love of making. And it's become like a political will, and it's become like a power will, and it become like a colonial statement, or it become like a decolonialist statement. Is whatever things in the human, there is not how to provide to something good, and then it comes and it's wrap up the history. So I think it's all about this kind of instead of this all of these things like a history in Indonesia. But this one is interesting. The theory from the Gadama, the 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 Dominic. Uh, Gordon's domain. It said that the primitive structure in, a, in some of the vernacular structure is based on the TP structures, meaning that the 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 volume could be decreased and the 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 forms of the 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 simple vernacular is derived from the tense structure, TP structures. So I I have this kind of um, inspiration that forms the Alpha Omega schools. So it's like a, the very angular structures that can uh, strengthen the, the roof uh, membrane. So it's become like a combination of bamboo and then steel and become like a very thin uh, steel and it's braced within the, 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 the hollow by itself. It's become like a form and it's strengthened. The, the structure that used to be one story. So it's, a, it, it's an act of integration between the cross field, between a, 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 an architecture and a mechanical electrical. Provide the mock-up like that, it's becoming over and over, it's becoming over and over. And, and at the end, it's like, uh, uh, you can see that I see hermits sometimes when I see them, I'm stammering because it showed a uh, progress. It feels a bit dizzy when the hermit comes, but I'm excited to see it more and more. So then into the microclimate and the need of the public space, but not only the public space, but we need the pattern. The pattern is improved where there is a public space. The problem in Jakarta and in many, many countries, in like many spaces in Indonesia, we don't have any adequate public space. This was said actually. But the patterns will improve the public space. Uh, and then the need of the space for children or us and our children part to play. So this is the act of our studio to provide the children's space for the people around us. They're putting all of the things like the modularity is like extending to the children's space. It's like a dedication for the community. And the, the modularity is need to, to extend analysis to techniques. So it's modularity of the architecture techniques can bring back the phronesis back to technique again. So phronesis and technique is one to another way. It's like a up and front, up and front, and things like that. So when it becomes technique, to, uh, I think like a shining to the other projects. So what's uh, the hypothesis is, is very simple. We need just, I mean, I'm, I was thinking that probably we just need to fix our own circle first and then the circle will start become a, 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 a spread and spreader and the technique is just a basic like diagrams like this the one that i uh, we used to see in the like in an architecture book or catalog like a, like a, uh, the the courtyard the privacy the uh, the to to tackle the west side and then to provide the tropical climate to catch the water and things like that, to protect like like 
the light well. Lubang cahaya meaning a light well. So instead, instead of the technique, we mean that it's the knowledge. So when we have that one, it's, this become like a, and then the phronesis comes again. And the Nofi, the Sophia said, we need to stay focus again to love architecture again. And the, the phronesis and the technique integrates, the hand become a tools and the Sophia still stays. And then the phronesis comes and actually you can be question the tools. You can question the Photoshop. You can question the, whatever the 3D modeling software is. And you become understand that what you need is total integration of both of the hermits. The hand become tools. And Sophia will tend the intent, but not the agenda. And there is no agenda at all if you have the Sophia. <laughs> there is no agenda. Agenda to be famous, agenda to be, I don't know, seen or agenda to be whatever. The, the, uh, there is no agenda. It's just a good intent to, to put the effort in your life for architecture. And the result is continuation of your changing model of phronesis and technique, bringing a bit of the unpredictable pieces. So, and we, can, un, we cannot un, unlimit this one to bamboo, or in terms of uh, dead matter, if you have a technique, it's a cold, unrealized opportunity, dead materials. But when phronesis comes, the intuition of greening and opens up ecosystem cools down the area. So I think the technique and the phronesis has a spirit of the opening the boundaries, changing the material. Entrance is not one, but multiple. And multiple, which is not a solid, but liquidified. And then it's understanding the walk of the uncomfort zone is comfort. But prioritizing your love is needed, like uh, put the appropriate pictures and things like that, and pin finding the appropriate sunlight. The appropriateness is very important now because you know the technique, you have the Sophia inside you, but you still don't know what's going on is this. You smell it, I smell it, I uncover it into many symbolic meaning. The symbol could be meaningful. It's realized over and over. And finding the appropriate sunlight, whether it's a techniques concrete, or uh, whether it's uh, uh, in the casting of the concrete is always precious. But at the end, the craftsman is important. They are designers of the site. We can learn from them into duality of process, hearing, listening, and discussing. And then you see what is the door is not straight. It's the discussion with the craftsman who can make it. It's the act of the phronesis. And when you repeat it over and over, whether it's normative or it's the affordable for the generic things, it's still a grammar. And it's become your own grammar, and it's become like intuitions. And whether it's the is a circle or is a is a rectangle, the budget is still the same. If you know the techniques, it's not about the form anymore. It's about how far you can push your own grammar. And then when I appreciate nature and bring the climates, the moon orchid blooms in the Jakarta naturally without me mechanic conditioning. The moon orchid is very difficult to grow in the Jakarta. It's easy in the Bandung in the cold climate, but in Jakarta it's so damn difficult. And it, it comes when, in, 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 when, and before it takes it and the phronesis comes, it's technique again and the phronesis comes. Then the technique is integrated with phronesis, the Sophia stays. It's always like that when, when we have this kind of thing, it's still in the garage scale. So I think in the very small things, big things, and we find the appropriate. Uh, the way that I can understand the epistemy is through the books of learning. And the act of experimentation is the seat of epistemy. So without the books, without the writing, without the reading, it's very important to understand it because we kind of lost in these four worlds of the hermit. The fourth hermit, the epistemic, is the one is more demanding because it needs to have like a total integration of the three and then you can come to the epistemic. The archive is the seat of the epistemy. An archive is an act of evaluation. So I think uh, uh, the more on the archive, by the multiple talk, now I talk too much, and we have a window that can be opened using a plastic. So I think uh, this, uh, this, this window, use a plastic as a transparent material. <laughs> it's so light, and its hints is just so optimal. So it's, it's like uh, opening the new things again. And uh, the culture, the crowd, is important to be celebrated, archived, and appreciated. And then comes a happy theme. So promising collage and structural materials, simple composition, framing the dust, and, and then it becomes the forms of grammar, tectonics grammar, and everything. So I think I'll just become like a, I mean, uh, a man can be open with, with all of understanding these four techniques. 
even though it's become like a without any window, with a window and become uh, like a studio, it's become like a library. So it's become like a space that I live and space that we live as in a studio become like a happy team. So from this one molding the steel without any expert, without any equipment at all, it's just like a, you're slicing it bits and pieces and weld it uh, without any factory, uh, sending to factory. And we, we can get now the tectonic grammar and putting into ergonomic and have a more operational now. So I think uh, the, the, the next phase is all about the using a bamboo experimentations into like a three stories uh, plus two stories of basement with a combination of the nine different types of materials uh, starting from the this adaptive uh, bamboo local bamboo symphodia not the not the monophodia because symphodia is very local basic of bamboo we, we call it street bamboo uh, probably we can call it now like a bastard bamboo <laughs> so I think I love what the chats word about the best that I think it showed uh, the, 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 the house, the vernacular way of thinking, the how to, to define the thought is as a language, which is we have like a low GDP actually. <laughs> the low GDP is the key. If you understand we are not like a, have a luxury like in the Europe or in the States, we can kind of understand our own DNA. <laughs> so it's an unpredictable act. So it's a greenery, uh, it's a, Bamboo is a low-tech material. We can uh, assemble it with a glue, only like a one basic uh, craftsmanship. And then we can define, it's become like a totally new space. It's using a dry techniques. It's, it, this is, this is all using a gypsum only, not, not using a, like a bricks or anything. It's just like a dry technique, which is very simple. And it's very cheap, actually. We kind of dream of this one, having this one for an informal settlement because many people need it for architecture for their own life. I think this is like a, the first attempt and to uh, like uh, define this all of this waterproofing membrane, the screening membranes to integrate the industrial and traditions, like uh, using tradition with the membranes of the industrial. We can create like a rich texture and it's adapt to the waterproofing uh, quality. And then when we see the piandeling, for example, uh, and then uh, this is the last uh, projects that I want to present. Uh, and then we see that uh, this is like a, the hall for the uh, piandeling is for the village. And uh, it's actually it's at a hall and there is a, a compound for uh, our family on the left side. And the right side is for the, the, the people of the village, like it become like a public library. And then it's become like a, the, the, the constant drawing is like this, you know, it's like a sketch, sketch like that. And the, the craftsman, with their finances technique can divine. And this one, this drawing is drawn after the construction finish. So basically we can question what's the methods of itself where we can communicating with the craftsman with the very simple techniques. So actually the, the, the key of this one is the uh, low span, uh, the multiple uh, bamboo uh, combining into one big columns. So it's safe actually without any cantilever structures. Okay. So, so that's very simple. And it's uh, covered by the plastics. And it's, you can see that it's, it's, it's from the front, it's like that. And you can see enter, entering the side. So actually the, the, it tries to, uh, to win, withstand from the wind pressure because it's quite windy. And it's like a, uh, of the uh, a transition between the tradition and the uh, more uh, elaborated contemporary uh, uh, direction like uh, art and craft movement that uh, all of this structure of this one using uh, like a uh, carving techniques by the bamboo and this big size is a uh, work by six people which uh, drive from the alpha omega and then uh, Guha and then Guha Bamboo. And then it becomes like the language of the, um, the bamboo. And, uh, I think uh, there are like a three pieces, like a, one is the tubular, like a Sumara building. Another one is Kujangs, which is like an open hall. And there's a Sadarhana, which is quite uh, in the basement uh, building. So it's become like a place for yoga, place for uh, therapy, the, and place for the uh, quiet uh, for the uh, villagers to stay. There is just to fill the play with the rabbit or play with the a chicken, and then there is like a place for the player, like a for 
for just be quiet and then we pray in the underground. So we kind of feel of the architecture is like a blessing us. So this is the epilogue, the Craftsman Guild Murakabi is the latest of our projects. It opens up to the more possibilities because we're not defining the, the materials as like only one materials, it's like a more than 12 materials. Like a plywood is in the house, like a, a solid a glass uh, and solid, solid flexible glass is in the house. Uh, it's like a mud is in the house. So it's like a become like a, the composition of the multiple matters because the most available thing in, in, in the site is like a, using this kind of bricolage of the materials. So this is previously, the, this has like a three stages. Previously using, using a simple techniques, using, uh, using the, 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 the simple foundations with, uh, with the wood uh, foundations. Uh, and it's like a Miss Van der Rohe building, like a floating uh, Fansford house, but it's using a, a plywood system. And first of all, it's the low quality. We try to fix the thing. And then we try to make our own glue laminated system with, uh, uh, with the recycled <laughs> plywood. And we bolt it. We try to put the membrane and it's calculated by the structures. And voila, it's, it's, it's built, it's, it's constructed. Uh, see the, the person on the right side is the, the designers. <laughs> Our studio can jump like that. They're, he's crazy. He's a, he's a Phronesian, you know, can jump and argue about the, how to make the, the structure ready. And it's, a, it's the languages of the site and the languages of the, use the light, light, light still. Combined with multiplex with a plywood, and it's become like a combination between the gypsum, like a like a light steel, and it's become like a, a recycled um, galvanized, and there is like a paving there, and a lot of materials coming there, and when we we divide like a water torrent is with, with the material like a wood, and it's 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 it's, 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 a, it's a attached to the uh, the 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 trees the tree over there. So we don't cut the tree and so you put the trees over there is for the uh, water tank. And the combinations of the of the, mm, the, 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 the the toilet, the circular one in the Alpha Omega school. And I get inspiration, the jellies from the Lori Baker's uh, architecture, which is I really adore. I mean, I, I, I really adore how we can always learn from the other region. It's a cross region already. It's a cross nationality. It's a cross people. It's a multiple perspective, and then it's big language of the gypsum between the, the the wooden and and the last is perforation steel uh, to to hold the structural lip, and then and we, we have the roof garden made by made by uh, wood. So this one is unpredictable because uh, of course we need to have like an integration with the structure engineer. But how comes we can, I can forget this kind of uh, innovations is happening in the backyard of our workshop. So I think it's by understanding all of these pieces and all of the social relation problem, this, this one simple photos, it can achieve like a five qualities of the craftsmanship and it can hold like a, the very heavy uh, of the uh, weight of the, uh, Two water tanks there, and then uh, at the end, I will just to summarize into this kind of grammar steps. Uh, it's very important to archive whatever things that we have done, uh, and then we share it to the public, and then we uh, we and then including the methodology, design methodology, including from from the context, from the envelope, from the spaces inside, from the mechanical, electrical, from the energy and water, from the materiality, and then when we ask again for these four things about the hermits. So I think if we can combine all of that thing and we can evaluate it in the, uh, in the full day, so we can understand that our approach me and we can feel very happy because we, we contribute something to the people around us. I think that's one the most important. So at the last part, I want to conclude with the crisp cast nine. It's a technique in the chemical engineering or the, in the DNA engineering just to cut the DNA and provide the improvement. And you can get the integration of the new DNA that you can have the new things going on. I think this can sums up what uh, Chad's uh, doings and then 
It is very sensitive. And you guys, you can, can cut your own DNA. And then you can fill in some of the DNA. And you can engineer your own DNA. And it's become like a, how the CRISPR work. It's the new way of methods in the dis, design community. I think this is the future of the design community. The CRISPR works, but it's not now, but it's shared within the platforms. So I think this is comes to the, my latest uh, the, the slides. Uh, I was thinking that there is a word for what uh, we have done, but it's, uh, it's given by one of the professor, my friend. Uh, he call it bricola. Just to unify phronesis, technique, sophia, and epistemy to create harmonious entities as a design method. This concept of reality explores how architecture should optimize local resources, integrate building technology, and adapt the implementation method, which builds the structure and local genius. We know that implementation method is very difficult. Not only the drawing on the table, but the implementation, you need, that, you need to be there and watch the craftsman build something. And you need to understand it and argue with them. Sometimes you need to conclude something with them. The bricolet examines the roots and the progression of the social network that cultivates the building tradition manifested in the generation of traditional craftspeople. So architect should not be alone. It should be attached to the social uh, network. So I think that's uh, uh, conclude my presentations. So I kind of uh, feel that probably, yeah, for me, bricolage is something of epistemy that uh, I, I should uh, walk, uh, but I think this multi people and techni and Sophia and epistemic comes and I feel stammering. Thank you so much for the uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much for the sharing session, Mr. Rivich. It was really informative and it's a lot to take in right now. <laughs> so um, I'm going to move straight to the questions that the audience Okay. Oh yeah, there's a few questions. Um, I'll start with the the one at the top. When you realize the company you work for has technology that is not applicable to Indonesia, did you completely disregard or integrate them to your practice? Hmm. Shall I answer it? No. How do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, for for me, uh, I still have a connection with uh, Foster and Partners, TP Architects, or Ubani until now. So I I have a uh, grateful that I have worked with them. So not in little bit in my disregard all of the experience, but I emphasize that what I learned from the experience, the way that I can integrate the building technology into the architecture. Actually, I learned from. Uh, Foster and partners that they can do it in the Stansted airport by just flipping the mechanical electrical systems to the ground. But actually in Indonesia, we have not that kind of a high technology. Uh, uh, and, but I think it's not about the technology or whatever things, but it's all about the mindset. I'm, I still think that me ready for, for this certain scale, you know, I, I think my, my me is just like uh, the formative years of my practice. Uh, so I'm trying to understand what I can, I am capable of, and trying to integrate uh, that kind of my previous experience and my current experience and my father experience, my grandfather experience into my practice. So understanding that I have a limit of my capability in this time, I think, uh, and evaluations again, I think. Uh, I can say that, okay, this is enough for me. I think that's uh, I, the feeling of that grateful, important. And then we can just be friends, uh, brotherhood with all of the people without like a sense of the uh, weakness, you know, like a weakness because of are we competing with other people, we competing with our previous office. I don't think it's like that. I think I think we can learn from many, many people. I think we, do, we should be grateful. And you know that the, the, the open house of the Samsung Hotel that Chats present, I was there. And that, that's I, oh. I met uh, Chat for the first time because I had the appointment with Bunsum. Uh, and I greet Chat at, at the time and I <laughs> love the, the dance at TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> 
What a small world. <laughs> What a small world, you know. And then Veronica said, oh, there is a chance coming for the young professor. Oh my God, I love to meet him <laughs> because I want to see, see him present something, you know, in the architecture. Yeah. True. Um, okay, I have to sort of speed through the questions. Uh, moving on to the next one. Um, why do you think some countries fetishize, feti fetishizes skyscrapers when in fact human skilled public spaces are more needed? Sorry. This is this is my question to the government. But you know, <laughs> this uh, because uh, because they don't have options. You no, know? mm -hmm. uh, we are like a lack of the uh, lack of the progress for so many times. I mean, so many years. And we're still chasing the progress by adding the skyscraper in the order probably to be seen as a, a progressive country. But I think uh, we, are we are copying paste or some of the rules and urban guidelines from, from the other countries without either taking it for granted. But I was thinking some, some of the solutions. Okay, if some of the government things like that, that's okay. But in case there's, if there is one text using a bastard techniques, or using a bricolas technique, or using like anan techniques in the high rise, it could be more meaningful, you know? I'm, I'm still fighting for that. Using a low techniques, using like a multiple plywood and using, but it's a high rise. It's a multiple enriching of human's life. Of course, it needs to be like uh, safe and it needs to be like a, a re well researched. But I think if we are keep doing the same thing, we don't know what future might do to our life. But I don't think we should practice the skyscraper but understand that the skyscraper there is there for, for a reason. And we should criticize. Criticize it meaning the appreciations, not only looking the negative things. The definition of the criti criticism is the appreciations, actually. By knowing the layers behind the skyscraper's conditions, I think we know that we are still housing. And that's... That's work in Indonesia as well. The 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 seat of the mid-rise housing. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, mm. we we still lack of it. Yeah, as that's a reality. Sure. So sad, but yeah, we need to fight. Yeah, we should. Mm. Yeah, should look at the layers instead of just criticizing it from a very negative point of view. Okay, mm. yeah, I agree with that. So I'll ask another question, which would be with regards to reading, does it take long for you to travel like into a building? Okay, it takes long. I, it took <laughs> me for, for a long time to, to read uh, the strange details, the theoretical anxiety, to Frampton's reading, like uh, the, the poetics of the constructions, uh, construction culture, and then uh, some of the tech, tectonics culture. And then it takes me for a longer time for me to digest what's going on. But I think the world of episteme has the uh, beautiful end. But we still need to have a marathon. Or we still need to have a patience to understand what's going on around us. But keep on reading, guys. It's, I mean, it's uh, your escape point. Is a uh, quite a word by the by the people, especially the Aristotle and some of the philosophy book and the methodology book is is very important. Uh, I, I I recommend uh, some of the book uh, and then uh, that's the way how to understand something. Without any book, there is no like a advancement in the um, that's written advancement that you can learn in the di distance learning. There are uh, two ways of the learning, right? And one is like a guru, like a direct learning that you need to be apprentice of someone. But that someone is rare. They are very, very uh, limited in their capability of meeting people, you know? And we need to have like another technique, which is like a distance learning. And with that understanding that kind of limitation of time and the people, we can see that the, the, the importance of design theory to, 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 to integrate the methodology, the, the case studies, and then you can evaluate it again. But I think that's reading important. It took me like uh, five years in theory to be, to, be, to be integrated again over and over. 
and and then it, there is like a seed of uh, our own episteme because five years is combined like a 20 weeks of the building construction in indonesia so i sum up like a one construction of the building is 20 weeks so if you 20 weeks 20 weeks 20 weeks you can parallel of, of the of the building you can have like a minimum like a, in one team you have like a three projects in the five years three projects meaning that you can always like a relate one not only two but only three that's a minimum so i think within the cross platform we can just learn from the uh diversely yeah that's why we need the five years you own sorry <laughs> but yeah. do you only read like philosophy books or only books related to architecture or do you also find inspiration from something out of architecture like non-fiction stuff fiction books or something like yes. that I do you a ever little gain little I'm prince, sorry? Little oh, prince okay. and then uh little prince and i read uh, um, uh alchemy uh, I read uh, many of the leadership books uh, uh, written by Robin Sharma, by Simon Sinek, by many of uh, Seth Godin. Uh, I have like a half of my book is like, uh, only probably third of my book is like a leadership book. And uh, some of it, they are a comic book. And I, I write a fantasy book as well about Narayana, like uh, the journey, oh. like a little prince journey to know, to jump to another universe with your rocket. So it's, a, it's like a drawing of cartoon, <laughs> things like that for the children to learn architecture. So it's something like that, you know, if, uh, it's, it's like a, everywhere you can take architecture. Yeah. But I'm, I limit myself into architecture, not into like a property developer on to like that. You know, I yeah. limit myself. <laughs> <laughs> Understand. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask um, another two questions. Um, this one would be, you celebrate na nature and organic language into your build forms. Do you have any challenges when attempting this? Uh, yes, many challenges. Uh, um, because nature, to understand nature, you need to silent and slow down. Uh, and did trial and error. Actually, when, when I understand the moon orchid, when I understand the species of the trees, it cannot, it cannot be done in the fast language uh, in order to get the evaluations you need the time to digest it uh, but uh, the, the not on it's not about yourself but how you uh, with other uh, principle uh, in, for example in one of our project we provide uh, clean water for the uh, pond and the pond becomes swimming pool so people can swim with the fish using a natural pond system so that kind of practicing the uh, disciplinary is this is one example which is quite interesting for like a one case for the one elements in the house and i think that's the nature and that's the organic language uh, and how to uh, de define the physics but the form itself is so damn challenging how to define bilinear concrete for example I think the curvilinear it is another stage of the how we understand the biophilic forms. But uh, to understand the biophilic form is not only about the form itself. We need to, to finish the generic functional problem first before adding the more aesthetic of, and it will come together in the one shot. So the, the challenges is to understand what is the priority that you wanna fix first. And then after that, you fix it one by one, right? And at the end, you combine everything and you start again. So the uh, 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 repeating it and losing your first iterations, uh, leave it, leave it, leave it go, is very damn difficult. And at the end, you need to redo it in one one goal again. You lose it everything and you do it again in one goal. So it's like a discipline like that. And after, uh, I think it's very fruitful moment when you meet a client. Because when you meet client, people start to understand your own thinking. When, when people to start to understand your own thinking, you can get trust by the people, even though you, need to, you don't need to draw and people start to trust you. And of course you, you will get the projects. But I think that's kind of things that we always need to educate people by talking hard to hard certain things like, like sharing things to people without they're asking to us, just helping people. I think it's important. And that's the challenge to 
combine nature and organic language. The challenge is in the context itself, not about the making of forms. Making a form is difficult because you need to find the technique how to make it, the detailing and things like that. But of course, it will gradually improve by the time. If you, if you don't improve it, your building will not look so good. <laughs> it will be so good and the, the price will itself will become so expensive and you will get criticized by your own client. It's like a soft reflections thing. So I think if you open to anything, you can just uh, open the ear for the client's need. I think it's very important attitude. True. That mm. is very, very true. <laughs> so I'm gonna move on to this last question. Um, knowing that you emphasize the importance of reading in benefits of architectural design, what is a what book is a good start for you? Uh, I have a like the yeah, prince. I, I have uh, two books for a good start. Not a little prince. Little prince, I I read it <laughs> at the end of at the end of my reading <laughs> because I need to bring back my own Sophia, you know, <laughs> my little yeah. my little friend of me. Uh, he will he will start to greet me again when I'm stammering. It's a little prince, it's a, but the the one book is uh, uh, to be honest, it's very shame that it's in Indonesian. It's a book written by uh, Romo Mangun Wijaya called the Vastu Citra. It's a combination between the fantasy, the novelty of the art, doing architecture, and the uh, uh, and, and the prioritization of the architecture is for the. And the way that he put the 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 the, the, the all of the element is like a, a having a one of good episteme, but it's still in the child language, <laughs> you know. It's in the childish language, you know. It's like a very simple things, and uh, uh, it's mm. it's good. I like I like it because it's, it's. I think that if there is a uh, a digital book, probably you can translate it. It's a book by Mangun Wijaya called What Fastu Citra. I mean the image of the architecture knowledge. Vastu, uh, F -A -S -T -U. Vastu Chitra. Vastu. W A S T U uh, C I T R A. I have in my, I mean, if, if I mean, uh, I hope that it's going to be like a translation soon. But yeah. the second book is, is like a gener general book. It's book usually uh, given by to the master degree. And I, I was oh. criticized by my, my prophet to give it to. To my to my students, but I challenge him, and then I I it, it comes it came down when when I I I produce a book uh, about my students' uh, design approach using this book, so the book titled uh, "Theoretical Anxiety" uh, is is written by Rafael Monio. It's very damn book because Rafael Monio not read the book about himself. He wrote the book about the another seven architects, like Aldo Rossi, like Gehry, like Venturi, like like Remkulhas, Eisenman, mm -hmm. and uh, and many many architects. But the most important part is he, he showed that every architects have a failure on their theory, but they justify it, and then keep moving and find new theory, and it's a act of transformations from the beginning. Of until the end of their career and they're still progressing. But at the end, he said that, he wrote that uh, not every works their masterpiece. The works that the architects done in a very critical moment, that is masterpiece. A critical moment meaning their survival instinct comes and they have like a, this fresh ingenuity during the time. And that makes me alive. And then Ramonio has a very good attitude. And then he wrote about their his, I mean, his friend method, and he shared it in the this I think Princeton or the Harvard uh, lecture about this book. I mean, it's a chronological. There is like a years by years, and there's like a lesson learned with the with the pictures, pictures there, and there's like a year, and there's like a caption what you can learn from it, and another caption. I mean, one. One, one architect has like a 80 or 130 pieces of the captions, thing like that. Wow. The book is like a tick like that. <laughs> I mean, I have to, I have to thank Monio for this, writing this book is enriching. Kipnis tried to, to write a similar book about the architects, but I, I don't think that, because Monio has a diagrammatical, 
sequence. Mm. Is that good? So it's called theoretical anxiety. That's right. Okay. You can you can search it in in Google or I mean there is like a. It's your architectural bible lah. Uh, oh yeah, I, I it's, it's the. the <laughs> Do you Sorry, remember I, it I, by heart? Yeah, but I I I when I read a book, I have to do a book reading for for my students. Uh, that's my and I record it and I studied my interpretation again. So it's the act of a recording, evaluation, understanding, and then published it and recording, evaluation, understand it and published it again. So I think by doing that and that and we kind of get what's going on inside his thought and probably we can do a hyperbolism. Like a criticizing of the morning's writing through the lens of ourselves, but I think it's our own problem. You know, I mean, I mean, I have to share to you the the seat of the the thinking. The interpretation could be many faces, you know, many helmets. Thank you so much for the answer, <laughs> and I would like to thank all the three speakers to who joined us for today. Thank you again, Mr. Rich, for that very, very yeah. informative session. Yeah, we are very sorry that we have to cut all of you guys' session quite short. Um, I'm sure that we all learned a thing or two about the enriching lifestyle through the processes that we, um, our chief speakers have described. So we appreciate you guys for taking the time on a Saturday afternoon to give us an insight on this topic. But now, before we move on to our photo session, we would like to take a short amount of time to spin the wheel of the names to reveal our lucky draw winner. So I'll pass it on to obviously to share the screen and spin the wheel. Okay, we have quite a number of names here. Thank you to everyone who joined. Okay, <laughs> I'm not sure it's quite laggy. Um, okay. Is that it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, congratulations to Ryan Ng. Um, wait, I'd have to check. Is Ryan here with us? Okay, he is Ryan Ng Zen, is it? Okay, so we would contact you further on the details of the ebook. You have won yourself an ebook. Congratulations. Um, okay, we have now come to an end of this talk, and I would like everyone to turn on their cameras to join us in this short session of the group photo. Yeah, don't be shy, everyone. You can open your cameras now. Okay. Um, okay. So I think <laughs> the rest are not going to open their cameras. So I guess, okay. Um, okay, some of them are opening it. Okay. You can start. Okay. So everyone, on three, one, two, three, say missing scenes. Okay. Um, okay, so after that photo session, before you go, I would like to cordially invite everyone um, on our very special events night tonight. Um, okay, sorry, I'm gonna wait for the slides first. Okay. So the performance night, it's called Unveiling. So we have an amazing lineup of performance and also performance for everyone. So not just that, we have also like exciting prizes waiting to be won for tonight's show. I mean, like as just, we just had like a lucky draw now, there will also be more prizes waiting for you tonight. And it is live on our Facebook page and all so you can join our zoom like now and you can also just open it while listening to listening while you're doing your work and besides that we also have our ebook on sale so do make sure that you place your orders before we close them and this is the last chance for you to get it 
And for tomorrow, we would be having a group of well-achieved speakers and having discussion on practicing architecture. There would be AR Lilian Tay, AR Mustafa, AR Michael Cheng, and AR Sao In. So on top of that, we will have our final scene that is the closing ceremony happening right after that. So tomorrow will be our last day for this exhibition. So everyone is invited to join and it will be a day to remember indeed. So before I end this session, I would like to ask everyone in Zoom to give us a feedback for this session by answering the poll that will be, yeah, it will be on the screen here. So yeah, you can just provide us a feedback on how the session went and everything. So thank you everyone for joining us today. We are very glad that you, are, you spent your, one of your weekends with us. And thank you also to the speakers again. We really appreciate it. So see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Thank you, thank very you much. Mr. Bye. Anand. Thank you, bye. Mr. Thank Railridge. You. Thank you. It was really okay, nice. Bye. Take care. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. Anand, yes. bye. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining.